Well, good evening and good morning. Apparently we have zero time for introductions tonight or this morning and that. So I'm going to move right into the talks. And our first talk is by uh, Lori Weikamp from the 2019 cruise and Sabrina Garcia from the 2020 cruise. So Lori, I'm going first, so go ahead, please. Hear me? There we go. Thank you. Today, we're going to be talking about predation on Pacific salmon on the high seas. I'm going to start with some background information on predation and try and glean what we can from the data collected in 2019 and 2020. And then Sabrina is going to talk about some really cool new work she's been doing looking at salmon sharks and end with some recommendations for 2022. Next. I think it's really important to realize that predation is still one of the big unknowns for salmon marine ecology for any population of Pacific salmon, we have a really poor understanding of basic information, such as who the predators are. Are they fish, birds, marine mammals? When does most of the predation happen? Is it random or is it selective? Are they selecting small or unhealthy salmon? And how does it vary in time and space? Are there seasonal or interannual differences? Are there predation hotspots out there? And this is especially true, uh, our under lack of understanding of these once salmon leave the coastal waters. Next. And a lot of the reason for our lack of understanding is that it's really challenging to study salmon in marine waters. They're a minor component of the diet of most predators, so they typically have very low frequency of occurrence and low abundances, even though the predation they're ex experiencing may have population level impacts. The diets of some potential predators, especially porpoises and dolphins, is poorly characterized. We know they eat fish and squid, but uh, not so much how much salmon they eat. And with a few exceptions, it's really rare to catch predators uh, in the act of predation. So I included two photos. One is a common mirror that's bringing a juvenile salmon back to feed its young and a stellar sea lion eating a salmon in front of a big hydroelectric dam. Those are kind of the exceptions to that. Uh, the picture on the right is a adult coho salmon stomach with some juvenile salmon that is, is very unusual. And the classic example of this is this paper by Bob Evett and uh, Greg Kurtzikowski, where they look through thousands of Pacific hate stomachs, found five individual salmon in those, and it, it estimated that perhaps as many as 6 million salmon had been consumed over a number of years based on those five salmon. So huge, huge uncertainty. Next. So who are the likely predators on the high seas? And Christoph talked on this, touched on this on his talk last night. So we have fish in the form of lancet fish, dagger tooth, spiny dogfish, salmon sharks, and lamprey, and also marine mammals, porpoises and dolphins, tooth whales, and of course, pinnipeds. Next. So what can we learn about predators that are out there based on the cruises and the data we collected in 2019 and 2020. On the right, I'm showing the percent of fish that were examined that either had wounds on the top or scars on the bottom. And wounds are just fresh, fresh injuries, scars are healed wounds. And the solid lines in each case are the percent of fish of that species across both cruises. And you can see that uh, there doesn't look like either year stands out or any particular species stands out as having a lot of wounds or scars that we observed uh, in the two winter cruises. We examined about a thousand salmon and roughly 2% had wounds and almost 3% had scars. And I should say this wounds includes abrasions that we actually think some of which are caused by sea lice, which wouldn't be counted as predators. And so this two or 3% with wounds and scars is a, a bit higher than what was observed in the Western Pacific in winter by Nadeko et al. But it's certainly much lower than what they reported, the same authors reported for summer, which may reach as high as 10 or even 15% of salmon having wounds. Next. And I think it's really important to realize these are the survivors. These aren't the victims, uh, these ones that have wounds and scars. So we really don't know who, who got eaten out there because they died. That was the whole point. 
Next. Uh, so there's a really nice paper by Bugev et al. that describes the different wounds that you would expect to see by different predators. So he groups them into four categories of predators. We have lancet fit and dagger tooth, which create these slashes on the side of the fish, lamprey, which cause the classic bullet hole shape, salmon sharks leave their tooth prints, and then finally seals, uh, their incisors uh, create these rips on either side of the body. Next. So using this guide and then the notes that people wrote down during the cruises of what they thought uh, caused the the uh, wounds that they saw. I I came up with these categories and and numbers of fish. So for sam uh, for fish predators, about a third of the salmon wounds we thought were caused by them. About fifteen percent by lamprey, ten percent from ma marine mammals, and almost half of the wounds we really couldn't tell what the source was. And I have to say, when people didn't write down what predator they thought it was, it's really difficult to look at a photograph and try and make an assessment of what predator you think that was. And our values are fairly similar to what was reported by Nadenko and others uh, in the Western, Western Pacific in the uh, winter. So they also had a fairly high percentage of uh, fish predators, as well as high unknowns. And I thought it's interesting that both their study and our study show a lower rate of marine mammal per predators, and perhaps those are more lethal attacks uh, than some of the others. And so you don't see those fish. Next. And finally, what did, what did which predators did we catch in the net? Uh, is, this is Christoph's slide that he showed last night, uh, showing that the two predators that we actually caught in the net, and we also saw in eDNA, were dagger tooth and spiny dogfish. And this is very consistent with previous work uh, during winter surveys, which also caught very few predators out there, which is a perfect lead in uh, to our next slide and the topic of uh, salmon sharks. So, uh, next slide and take it away, Sabrina. Shark distribution in the North Pacific with some notes on Pacific salmon predation. Next slide. So salmon sharks are a widely distributed apex predator in the North Pacific, ranging from Japan to the Bering Sea and south to Baja California, Mexico, as shown in red in the map on the right. The salmon shark is in the family Lamnidae, along with great whites, makos, and poor beagle sharks. And all laminate sharks are endothermic, meaning that they can keep their internal body temperature elevated from that of the ambient water temperature. And salmon sharks are believed to be the most endothermic of the laminate sharks and can maintain their internal temperature up to 21 degrees Celsius above ambient. The population structure of salmon sharks in the North Pacific is not well understood. There's believed to be two populations of salmon sharks in the North Pacific with sharks in the Western North Pacific ranging from Japan to the Bering Sea comprising one population, and those in the Eastern North Pacific ranging from the Gulf of Alaska to Baja California comprising the other. Like many other species of sharks, salmon sharks exhibit strong size and sex segregation across their range. Females are found in greater proportions in the Eastern North Pacific, and males are found in increasing proportions as you move farther north in latitude. Next slide. First, I wanted to describe what we know about salmon shark migration in the North Pacific. Salmon sharks in the Western North Pacific are believed to migrate north in the spring and re return south to Japan to overwinter. This migration pattern is based on incidental catches of salmon sharks in Russian and Japanese surveys from the 1960s through the 1980s. To date, salmon sharks in the Western North Pacific have not been satellite tagged or tracked. Salmon sharks in the Eastern North Pacific have a similar north-south migration with sharks present in coastal Alaska in summer and exhibiting southward migrations in the fall. Next slide. However, some individual sharks, salmon sharks, do remain in the Gulf of Alaska year round. Um, as Christoph showed in his presentation, he did have some eDNA e hits on salmon sharks during both the 2019 and 2020 expeditions, providing further evidence that sharks do remain in the Gulf of Alaska year round. Next slide. 
Many salmon sharks from the eastern North Pacific have been satellite tagged. The maps shown on the right are the results from the Tagging of Pelagic Predators program, where 113 salmon sharks were satellite tagged. But due to that segregation by sex and salmon sharks that I just mentioned, all of these tagged sharks were female. The top figure of the track are tracks from 10 sharks that shows their residency probabilities, and, and yellows indicate higher residency. So you can see higher residency in, in uh, South Central Alaska, Southeast Alaska, and in the Eastern North Pacific. The bottom figure shows the combined location from all 113 female salmon sharks. And so you can see in that bottom figure the extensive use of the Eastern North Pacific. Next slide. No salmon sharks have been satellite tracked crossing the North Pacific. So it's unknown if and when mixing would occur between these presumed Western and Eastern groups of salmon sharks. Next slide. In 2017 and 2019, we tagged two male salmon sharks from a surface trawl survey for juvenile salmon in the northern Bering Sea. Most sharks caught in the Bering Sea are males, which provides a unique opportunity to track this little studied segment of the population. The 2017 shark, shown in the top photo, was tagged with a pop-off tag that recorded light, depth, and temperature data for 12 months. The 2019 shark, shown in that bottom photo, was double tagged with both the archival tag, which you can see just below its dorsal fin, the same one that we used on the 2017 shark, and also with the satellite transmitting tag mounted to its dorsal fin. The dorsal fin tag transmit data every time the shark's fin is at the surface. And now this satellite tag will transmit data for about three years, and we're approximately halfway through the tag's life. Next slide. So we used light level and temperature data from the archival tag to recreate the 2017 shark's movement using hit, hidden Markov models. Each circle on this map is the mean estimated daily position generated from that model. The circles are color coded by month and the month is shown on the tracks as well. The arrows show the general swim direction and that yellow polygon shows the general area of the two Gulf of Alaska expeditions. So as you can see from this figure, after tagging, the shark quickly transited out of the Bering Sea in August and reached the Oregon coast of the Western United States in November. For the rest of the winter and spring, this shark remained off the coast of the Western United States before returning back to the Bering Sea in July, where he arrived at the end of August. And that's when his archi archival tag popped off. So that's the last data point that we have. Now, if you remember a few slides back, you'll notice that the tracks of this male salmon shark look pretty similar to those of the female sharks tagged in the eastern North Pacific. The shark's return to the Bering Sea is interesting because it seems like there may be some fidelity to this area, but the timing of the shark's return to the Bering Sea is after many salmon species have started their return migrations to their natal rivers. And now I also added the distance between each of those daily, daily locations to get a minimum estimate of the swim distance. And that distance came out to 18,800 kilometers. So that's how many, that's a minimum estimate of the kilometers swam because it doesn't account for any of the swimming the shark did below the surface. Next slide. And now these are the tracks from the 2019 male shark for his first year, um, the first year that he was tagged. And now each of these circles are a location that was transmitted by the tag while the shark was at the surface. So. For the 2017 shark, we had to recreate their tracks using the archival tag data, but for these tracks, these are actual, actual transmitted locations. Although this shark was tagged in the northern Bering Sea, his migration was distinct from that of the 2017 shark. Traveled uh, southwest towards the Emperor Seamount chain, where it remained from the end of October to November before heading east. The movements in the central North Pacific from January to April appear to be foraging behavior. Um, some of you may remember some of the slides that Dr. Rachenko showed about the winter distribution of salmon. And this area of the North Pacific exhibited large cat commercial catches of both pink and chum salmon. The 2019 shark also began traveling back towards the Bering Sea in June, where he arrived in the central basin in mid-July and on the Bering Sea shelf in August. Next slide. So I just overlaid the general area of the, the proposed 2022 Pan Pacific Survey, and that's shown in the dashed white polygon. And so in February or March, when the survey would take place, the shark would have been in zone four of the survey. Next slide. 
So picking up in year two, we see that the shark in September of 2020, the shark moved into the Gulf of Anadir in, in September, possibly to feed on herring aggregations in that area. But by October, the shark began swimming towards the Emperor Seamount chain again, where it remained through early January. So it would be really interesting to know why this shark has returned to the Emperor Seamount region um, these last two years. So what, what may be causing those returns to that area? Unlike the first year of tagging data, this shark returned to the Bering Sea in February. So in his first year of tagging, he returned in about August, and now we're seeing him return to the Bering Sea in February. So at this time in this area, the shark would have access to prey items like Pollock, Herring, and Chinook Salmon. And as of April 16th, which is the last time he was at the surface, you can see that um, very light green point in the lower left of the screen. That shark was back again near the Seamount region. Next slide. So again, if we overlay the location of the proposed Pan Pacific survey on the second year tracks, we see that the shark would have been outside the survey area in February or March. Um, it's just interesting to see the variability in these shark's tracks with these two years of data. And hopefully we'll get one more. Next slide. So I spent a little bit of time on horizontal migration, but I just wanted to touch on vertical migration. In general, salmon sharks typically remain above 60 meters in the summer, with most of their time spent in the upper two meters of the water column. The large number of locations that we've gotten from the satellite tag is a testament to how often these animals are at the surface. And Christoph's eDNA detections of salmon sharks were found in water taken from two to four meters in depth. In the autumn, salmon sharks exhibit greater variability in their diving, um, likely searching for other prey species during that time. But the vertical distribution of salmon sharks is variable across individuals. And this infographic on the right, it just shows the deepest dive for each of the species of Pacific salmon and for salmon sharks. And obviously this doesn't capture vertical migration patterns for each species, but the takeaway is that there is overlap, vertical overlap between salmon and salmon sharks. However, quantifying the extent of that overlap is limited by data deficiencies in the vertical migration patterns across time for all five salmon species. Next slide. So shifting gears a little bit to talk about salmon shark diets. Salmon sharks are considered opportunists. Uh, based on stomach content analysis, salmon sharks have a varied diet and appear to eat whatever prey is available, including spiny dogfish, sablefish, squid, Pacific salmon, pollock, herring, lancetfish, and there's many more that I found in the literature. Their diets also vary temporally and spatially. Generally, salmon are the primary prey items in spring and summer, with their diets shifting primarily to squid and other fish species throughout the year. But much of what we know about salmon shark diet is based on stomach content analysis, which only provides a snapshot of what sharks are eating at one time and in one place. Next slide. So I just wanted to talk about three diet studies on salmon sharks that analyze their stomach contents. Um, the polygons on the map correspond to the data in the table based on color. So starting with the blue polygon in the western North Pacific and the Bering Sea, of the shark stomachs analyzed, a third were empty, 54% contained salmon, and 14% contained fish or squid. And the primary prey item identified in this study was sockeye salmon in both years that they analyzed stomach contents. Continuing into the western North Pacific for salmon sharks retained from the yellow polygon, uh, squid were the dominant prey item by mass, comprising 96% of the contents over the two years, with the remaining 4% being unidentified fish. And moving east, shark stomachs were, were analyzed from Prince William Sound, Alaska, and they were sampled in July and August. And by mass, Pacific salmon dominated diets at about 76%. And it's interesting to note that even though salmon are abundant in this region in, in July and August, um, other fish species made up a quarter of their stomach contents. And by species, the salmon that were identified in the stomach contents were pink, chum, and coho salmon. And based on the timing of when these stomachs were analyzed, it makes sense that these three species were consumed as nearly continuous pulses of chum, pink, and coho salmon concentrate salmon sharks in Prince William Sound as late as September. Now these three studies aren't directly comparable because they use different methods to assess diets. Um, additionally, we don't know if the differences in diet we're seeing are based on season. So we, we're seeing spring and summer 
diets here. We also don't know if it's a difference due to location in the Eastern Pacific versus Western Pacific or a size difference as some of the sharks um, were sub-adult and others were adult sharks. But I just do want to highlight the lack of diet data outside of these four months. Next slide. So in terms of recommendations, um, what we want to see in future years is take pictures of wounds and scars on salmon. And when we do, make sure that the fish number is included in photos. And as Lori mentioned, if you can attempt to identify and record the potential predators immediately, it's a lot easier to do it um, on site instead of trying to remember what it looks like and uh, where you caught it you know, a couple months later when you're looking at data. Another thing we'd like to do is collect stomach contents of potential predators, and we can possibly use DNA on the stomach contents to identify prey items that we might not be able to see. We would also can do stable isotope analysis to determine diet over time. So if we do do a trawl and we do catch a shark and it comes on board dead, we can take a stomach sample. We can also take liver, muscle, and blood, and we can do stable isotope on those uh, samples and look at diet over time. If the shark comes on board alive, you can still take a muscle plug, and we could analyze that, that muscle sample. Uh, regardless, we should be taking fin clips from all salmon sharks, and those fin clips can be useful for genetic studies that um, are ongoing in both Canada and in Russia. And finally, we should distribute satellite tags on vessels participating on the Pan Pacific Survey in 22 so that any salmon sharks that are encountered um, can be satellite tagged. Um, and with that, that's all I've got, and I'm happy to take any questions, and thank you all. Well, thank you, ladies. That was wonderful. Uh, the salmon sharks is a real treat, since we really didn't have that in the cruise thing, did we? Mark, are you showing any questions for from there? I am not. Uh, lamnid sharks are scaring people away, I think. <laughs> okay, well, that's... <laughs> I like the idea of carrying the satellite tags. So where do we get them and how much do we have to budget and give us some details? Sure. So the archival tags, so the tags that measure the light, depth, and temperature data, um, those last about a year and they're about 3500 a pop. Um, and then the satellite cost for transmitting the data is about $200. Um, the Satellite transmitting tags are a little bit of a reverse situation where the tag is about $1,800 each, and then the satellite costs are like are about $750 a year, um, and those tags last three years. So we'd have to multiply, you know, the $750 by three, it's about $2,300, and then the $1,800 price tag of the tag. Um, but yeah, it, ideally, we'd get at least one tag. Um, on each, of the, on each of the vessels on the survey, and the more the better, because it, it would be a, a lost opportunity to not tag a shark if, if we caught them on the survey. Uh, Sabrina, that's Mark here. Yeah, Sabrina, thanks. Well, Mark. Uh, any indication of what the population size is and the potential impact uh, they could be having? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and lots of people want to know. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's believed that because of the ban on the high seas drift gillnet fisheries in the early 90s, there's some belief that with banning those fisheries that used to catch a lot of shark salmon sharks as bycatch, that there would be a rebound of the population. Um, in, in the literature, they did interview uh, fishermen along the Aleutian Islands, and they said that they've been seeing declines in their salmon shark catches in the last few years. And actually, some of the sport charter operations in South Central Alaska have started to only do catch and release on salmon sharks because of concerns about the population. So there's kind of two sides, and we don't really know, and, it's, and we don't have any direct way to estimate their population. So it's a bit of an unknown. Hmm. Do they know where these, um, where they're uh, popping? Like, do they um, pop in, the, in a particular area and time of the year? The yeah, so they're, yeah, so the, the, they're believed to, to mate in autumn and then the females give birth in the spring and there's believed to be two separate pupping grounds. So one on um, the coast of the western U.S. and, and that's based on um, strandings of, of really small salmon sharks that they see in that area. And mm -hmm. then there's also one in the western North Pacific kind of in that transition zone. Um, and, and so that the, having these two pupping grounds is another reason why there is some 
some belief that there might be two separate populations in the North Pacific. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had any questions uh, come through. Oh, here we go. Uh, Cameron okay, Freshwater is asking, uh, any evidence of diet specialization among individuals in salmon sharks similar to what is seen in pinnipeds or too little data to tell? Yeah, that's a great question. From from what I've been able to found it, find, it sounds like they just eat whatever is easiest to catch. And in summertime, that tends to be Pacific salmon. You know, if you have, you know, these runs of salmon, especially here in Prince William Sound, Alaska, where we have multiple species congregating, um, they're going to catch whatever is easiest. And so that's why salmon predominate their diets in the summer. Um, but as I mentioned, even though salmon are abundant, they're still, you know, a quarter of their diet is made up of other species. So um, it appears that they're just mm. eating whatever is around and whatever is available, not really specializing on one thing. Thank you. Okay, Mark, I Back think we should you, move on, I'm afraid. It is 525. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ladies. Great talk. Thanks, everyone. So our next speaker is back to Christoph Dieg. And this time, Christoph is going to talk to us about pathogens and parasites that he was sampling for. So Christoph, we'll shift it to you. Share my screen with you. And uh, here we go with uh, part three of my series, What's Out There, this time about uh, pathogens and stresses of overwintering salmon in the Gulf of Alaska. So the aim of this project was to uh, figure out uh, disease and stresses of overwintering salmon by using a molecular approach. And so for that, uh, on in the 2019 and 2020 expeditions, we uh, dissected uh, a number of fish uh, caught at every station uh, in a sterile manner and uh, took tissue samples in RNA later for later analysis of uh, nucleic acids, uh, as well as we took formalin samples for histology. And once we were back in the lab, we extracted the nucleic acids from those samples and then uh, put them on the Fluidime uh, biomark machine. And what that uh, machine is, is basically it's a high throughput quantitative PCR machine that's able to run uh, 96 assays versus 96 samples. So basically you can choose your uh, assays on the left here and load them into those wells and then choose your samples on the right, load them in those wells, and then they get all mixed up here in the middle in individual reactions and uh, in the end you end up with an output that looks intermediate like what we see down here where we have uh, individuals in the rows and the uh, different pathogen assays that are running duplicate in the columns and basically you can see uh, that for these uh, individuals up here we can see a strong detection of these uh, pathogens over here so this is the system we used to screen for pathogens because it allows us to really get high throughput pathogen screens done. But we used the same platform to also interrogate the gene expression of, uh, of the salmon that we uh, tested. And that gives us an idea of you know what genes are, are these expressing, uh, uh, fish expressing, and we're looking at uh, genes that are associated with specific stressors. So we can basically ask the salmon, how's it feeling, what is bothering you? and so on and so forth. And then in the last step, we kind of did histology to confirm our pathogen findings and correlate them with actual disease. So for 2019, uh, we screened 256 salmon. Uh, three of them were Chinook, 84 Chum, 80 Coho, 61 Sockeye, and 27 Pink. Uh, we looked or we checked for the presence of 48 pathogens, 11 bacteria, 17 parasites, and 20 viruses. We detected 21 of them. Um, when we look at how do the different species look in the Gulf of Alaska compared to the BC coast, you can see that in that graph here, you always have BC coast individuals in blue and uh, Gulf of Alaska in red. So we can see on the left, this uh, depicts the Shannon diversity index of pathogens in their uh, re receptive groups. And you can see that in Chum, the uh, BC coast has significantly higher diversity of pathogens uh, in the uh, then compared to the Gulf of Alaska, and the same is true for coho and pink. Um, on sockeye, the levels of diversity of pathogens are somewhat equal between the BC coast and the Gulf of Alaska. When we look at the relative infectious burden, so this is a metric that 
incorporates basically the number of different pathogens detected, but also their load. So the amount of this pathogen detected and sums it up in one metric. We can see that in CHUM, there was significantly lower relative infectious burden in the Gulf of Alaska compared to uh, the BC coast. The situation was the opposite for uh, COHO, uh, but again, lower uh, uh, relative infectious burden in the Gulf of Alaska in pink and sockeye. And uh, that, that's kind of interesting because, you know, as you can see, COHO has lower diversity of pathogens, but higher relative infectious burden. So that suggests that there were a few high prevalence pathogens that really shifted the balance there. So when we look at the prevalence of the individual agents, we can see here uh, top is COHO, uh, rather top is CHUM, COHO, pink, and sockeye. And down here, you can see the individual agents and then in a bar graph, the prevalence, you can see that across all species, there are a few pathogens that are basically uh, dominating and highly prevalent. So that is Candidacus brachymonas cysticola over here, which is a bacterium that infects the gills. And then there are two uh, parasites, Ichthyophonus hoferi and Loma, uh, Loma species that are highly prevalent in all species. And then uh, we also have species specific pathogens um, like Spirothecum destrans that pops up very strongly in Sokka and is a lot higher than on the uh, BC coast, as well as the uh, viral enteropathy and retinopathy virus in coho on the far right here. And uh, as you can see, uh, while CV cysticola is high, um, it's also high on the BC coast and only uh, significantly higher in pink, whereas it's significantly lower in sockeye and coho, whereas, for instance, the two uh, parasites, Ictifanus holfer and Loma Samone, are significantly higher across all species in the Gulf of Alaska compared to coastal British Columbia. And uh, when we look at uh, the actual load of the pathogens detected, so how much pathogen did the actual individual have for these highly prevalent agents, for instance, for here, the viral enteropathy and retinopathy virus, VER, Loma, and Ictyophonus hoferi, we can see that in CHUM, uh, the red are individuals from the Gulf of Alaska, blue are BC Coast individuals. You can see that the highest values uh, are found in the Gulf of Alaska. The same is true for COHO, where specifically for Ictyphonus sulfuri, we see higher levels than ever detected on the coast, as well as for the viral enteropathy and retinopathy virus. So that is really what's pushing the higher uh, relative infectious burden index for COHO are these uh, agents. And uh, a similar scenario is true, albeit to a lower uh, extent in pink and sockeye. Um, when we looked at the histology to confirm these findings, we kind of saw what would have been expected. So in the top left, you can see uh, a cross section through the heart of a coho salmon, and you can see a large uh, granuloma in the middle here and up here. And indeed, when we did in situ hybridization with a probe to detect ichthyphonus hoferi, we saw that these granulomas were indeed filled with uh, the parasite. The other high prevalence parasite, Loma, we did find it uh, in individuals that popped up in the screen, indeed in the gills. So down here, you can see a xenoma in the gill of a sockeye salmon. And on the bottom right figure, you can see two, actually three xenomas in the gills of a coho salmon. So to summarize what we saw uh, in the pathogens of overwintering salmon in the Gulf of Alaska in 2019, um, the Gulf of Alaska has in general a lower relative infectious burden uh, and diversity of pathogens than coastal British Columbia. Um, we see a higher relative infectious burden in coho though, and that is due to extreme high loads of a few selected parasites. And uh, what you would expect to see is you see that a lot of the coastal and freshwater acquired pathogens are kind of fizzling out in the ocean. Um, as far as specific pathogens go, as I said, there are the parasite uh, Loma uh, species that is extremely prevalent. So is the gill bacteria Candidatus brachymonas cysticola, um, as well as the path uh, parasite uh, Ichthyophonus hoferi, and in coho, the viral enteropathy and retinopathy virus. Um, the latter two are probably transmitted uh, trophically, so the salmon probably acquire them out in the ocean, and uh, it's, it looks to us like there is actually a reservoir uh, that uh, basically facilitates active transmission of these pathogens in the Gulf of Alaska. And uh, for sockeye, we saw elevated level of Therosicum 
pedestrians. And in general, um, pathogen profiles were stock uh, dependent in coho. So we saw a strong signal depending on stock. And in coho and chum as well, there was a, a difference in a pathogen profile dependent on uh, size of the individual. Now towards the second part, um, we used what we call the FITCHIP survey, as I told you, where we look at the gene expression of the actual salmon to determine what is bothering the fish. And we uh, assess the expression of uh, 89 genes that are involved in gill function. So those are hypoxia, osmotic stress, and inflammation genes, as well as uh, genes that respond to infection that are in immune stimulation and viral disease demand development. Then we have a couple of general uh, stress and thermal stress markers. And then we have uh, two different groups of markers that assess uh, morbidity and mortality. And those are the mortality related and imminent mortality uh, group of genes. And so basically, I, we were assessing the expression of those genes in the, uh, the tissue of these fish and then try to correlate them with the physiological condition of the fish, as well as the pathogens we had detected, uh, the stock of origin and a number of oceanographic variables like you know temperature, salinity, as well as like biological oceanography, like the prevalence of different uh, plankton, zooplankton groups. And the first step when we do this is we kind of make a heat map. And so you can see uh, in the rows are the different individuals and in the columns are the different genes and the genes are grouped by their respective uh, gene panels. For instance, in the far right here in purple, these are a viral disease development genes that usually pop up uh, when the fish has a viral infection. And then here we've just plotted the detection of pathogens as well as a bunch of other metrics like the relative infectious burden, the prevalence of uh, small zooplankton temperature and dissolved oxygen. And uh, the uh, different individuals are then clustered based on similarity in gene expression. What we can see is that in CHUM, there is a general trend uh, where these two bottom clusters uh, have lower gene expressions than the other ones. And that is correlated with a higher temperature, but also correlated with relative, uh, relatively in, uh, elevated relative infection burden and lower availability of the preferred prey biomass. When we look at the same data differently with the uh, PCA analysis, so you can see it, the individuals here are plotted uh, on PC1 and PC2, and basically the symbol uh, identifies the class that we identified in the heat map earlier. And you can see again that there's a group of individuals in the right corner that have a lower expression across all genes compared to individuals on the right. And then we have the different factors that correlate with the gene expression mapped on here. And the colored arrows basically represent the sum of all the genes in the different gene classes and uh, which way they influence the discrepancy. And so what you can see here is basically that overall gene expression is positively correlated, uh, increased with the prevalence of hydromedusa and small zooplankton, but uh, negatively correlated with uh, relative infectious burden as well as the prevalence of nematodes. And across the secondary PC, we can see that a relative infectious burden and nematodes are positively correlated with the expression of inflammation, immune stimulation, and viral disease development genes. So that kind of makes sense because that is a response to an infection. So to more simplify this, I've taken that all the data from the previous uh, plot and kind of summarized it even more. And so uh, in this case, I've plotted the preferred uh, prey item of chum in the Gulf of Alaska determined by stomach contents, uh, which were hydromedusa and plotted them against the relative infectious burden, temperature, as well as a factor that I've called uh, immunosuppression. So basically that's the negative factor of all the immune stimulation, inflammation and viral disease development uh, gene expression vectors. And so what you can see there is that basically in the, where there's lower biomass of their preferred prey, they have, they are immunosuppressed and that correlates with a uh, relative uh, infectious burden. So higher relative infectious burden, whereas temperature in chum has a, a not as important influence. Moving on to sockeye salmon. Again, we see a similar uh, assess, uh, a picture where there are some groups that have lower gene expression, like the group one up here. Uh, and uh, there are, again, correlated with temperature a little bit, but more so with prey availability. And there's a little bit of an influence also of condition factor. If we look at that uh, in the PCA analysis, again, a similar picture, two groups on the right here that have uh, overall lower gene expressions than others. 
and uh, they're impacted by temperature as well as the prevalence of uh, prey. Uh, and we also see a, a signal where Loma species up here is uh, strongly correlated with the expression of uh, inflammation and immune stimulation uh, genes. So at least for this one pathogen, there is a, a clear response. Uh, however, overall, relative infectious burden does not seem to be as strongly uh, important to gene expression. In that summary figure, um, that was kind of interesting because the primary stomach content of sockeye, which was euphausids, actually had a way smaller impact than small zooplankton on uh, uh, all the on immunosuppression in this case. And so I plotted it down here. And basically, we can see there that reduced prey prevalence and high temperature uh, uh, is correlated with uh, immunosuppression and increased uh, relative infectious burden. Moving on to coho salmon, there's a different picture. There is no overall uh, shifts in gene expression. Rather, we have uh, individual responses to the individual uh, biomarker panels that are correlating with uh, some metadata. So for instance, down here, we can see that the group four has uh, across the board higher relative infectious burden. So their expression profile is basically a response to infection. And uh, we also see uh, impacts of higher prevalence of different prey classes. When we look at the PCA analysis, we can see again that uh, inflammation, general stress, and uh, immune uh, stimulation, as well as viral disease development markers, so all these four here, are along the PC1 correlated with relative infectious burden, but negatively correlated with a pteropod uh, biomass, which was the primary prey source. And uh, we can also see that Loma had a strongly correlated re uh, response with uh, hypoxia and imminent mortality genes. On that summary figure, you can see, again, the primary prey is uh, directly opposing uh, relative infectious burden, but it does not directly correlate again, with along PC1 with immunosuppression, but it does so against along PC2. So that suggests that this correlation that we saw in uh, Chum and Coho is, uh, rather Chum and Sockeye, is lower in Coho. Um, finally, pink salmon, um, we again see a group that has overall lower gene expression. However, this time the relation is the opposite. So those are individuals that are at higher temperature and uh, have higher uh, relative infectious burden and lower prey availability. So uh, looking at the PCA analysis again, we can see that this group over here is still grouped with lower overall gene expression that's found at higher temperature. And uh, we can also see that uh, relative infectious burden is plotted along PC2. So that's a subordinate signal within the overall gene expression, but also uh, correlates with the prevalence of uh, the expression of uh, viral disease development genes as well as immune stimulation genes. And we, when we summarize that in the overall view I've shown you before, we can see that the preferred prey, uh, as well as in this case, condition factor, uh, are inversely correlated with uh, immunosuppression and uh, relative infectious burden and a very strong signal from temperature. So to summarize, the health of uh, overwintering salmon in the Gulf of Alaska in 2020, we see an overall picture where we have the opposing or uh, synergistic effects on salmon based on energetics as well as pathogens. So we can see that uh, immunosuppression is uh, across all species correlated with higher infectious burden, specifically in chum and pink and to a lesser degree in sockeye and coho. We see that this immunosuppression is also inversely correlated with prey availability. So usually we have immunosuppression in uh, individuals that are experiencing lower availability of prey, specifically in chum, sockeye, and pink. Um, in the northern part of the study area, we see a positive correlation between metabolism or gene expression and temperature. So that's mostly in chum and sockeye that were more distributed among the northern part of the area, whereas in the south, we kind of see the opposite picture where something that is correlated with uh, increased temperature is also uh, correlating with immunosuppression in pink and to a lesser degree in coho. And so these immunosuppressed individuals, uh, as I've said before, are experiencing higher relative infectious burden, but also have a higher prevalence of opportunistic pathogens like Candidatus brachymonas cysticola and Cerithicum destrans. But there's also a signal in there that um, size and condition factor, like good condition, is protective. So 
individuals that have more resources are more resistant to these trends. And so kind of ov uh, overall ranking the different factors that are stressing salmon in the Gulf of Alaska, uh, we could see that say that for chum, there's basically an equal uh, impact of prey availability as well as pathogens. For sockeye, it was mostly just prey that was impacting them. Coho was impacted primarily by the availability of prey to a lesser degree pathogens and a smaller impact of temperature, whereas Pink was primarily impacted by temperature to a lesser degree by pathogens and then prey availability. Um, that's all I had for 2019. And uh, coming up to this conference, I was really trying to get uh, the 2020 pathogen data analyzed, but I really couldn't do it. And that's where my dear colleague Caria stepped in and managed with two weeks warning, uh, push through the entire uh, samples from 2020. And so now it can give you a, a hot off the press analyzed overview of the pathogens of 2020 that I did that today. And so uh, in 2020, rather, this is, shouldn't be 2019, um, we uh, surveyed 181 salmon, uh, 12 Chinook, 46 Chum, uh, 34 Coho, 52 Sockeyes, 36 Pink, and one Steelhead. And we looked for 47 pathogens in this case, of which we detected 27. And basically, we see uh, on this map, you can see in uh, blue 2019 and in uh, red 2020, and again, uh, sorted by uh, species. And down here are the respective pathogens. We can see that the usual suspects uh, are highly prevalent, like Candidatus brachymona cysticola, uh, Ictiphonus hoferi, as well as Loma salmone. We also see a few other ones popping up. We see uh, Myxobolus arcticus. Uh, which is coming up here. And that is mostly a technical artifact because we this time included brain in the analysis, which we didn't before. We also have a few new pathogens that we didn't look at before. So there's this uh, parasite, uh, Facilis bora margolesis, that is new. So that pops up uh, here. So that seems to be mediocrely prevalent across all tested species except the steelhead. And uh, again, the uh, gill chlamydia, uh, Syngnomedia salmonis, which is down here, was uh, sp uh, significantly more prevalent in sockeye and pink in uh, 2020 than in 2019. And with that, I'd like to thank the crews of 2019 and 20, as well as you for your attention and all the people that contributed greatly to this talk. Thank you. Well, thanks, Christoph. That's amazing you got through that detail and under your time. So we have a bit of time for questions. If anybody can follow all of that quickly. <laughs> uh, Christoph, I have to say we... that one. Go ahead, Mark. No, no, go ahead, Brian. Well, I don't, yeah, go ahead. Well, actually, I was just going to ask, I was surprised we didn't see a stronger relationship with some of the variation we see in condition factor. And that, but that I think only came up once in your analysis yeah. on that. So uh, interesting because we always think of that as some measure of the health of the fish in a broad context. And that, but yeah. So I I, I think it it comes down to the fact that uh, gene expression it reacts a lot faster. Like condition factor is something that you know the fish acquires over like a longer period of mm -hmm. its life. Whereas the, the gene expression can respond really quickly. So if a, if a fish in a relatively poor condition factor inquires a favorable environment, it can basically turn around its gene expression within days, whereas the condition factor will be lagging behind. Yeah, that's a good thought. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So I've got a question here from uh, Lori Whitecap. Um, have you looked for stock specific differences? Yes, so I've uh, stocks have always been in my analysis, and I've only mentioned it once throughout the talk because uh, stock specific differences really only came out properly for uh, coho salmon. Um, it was also an issue was that basically the stock resolution I had for uh, chum wasn't that really convincing, so there were a lot of not assigned fish, and that really threw off the analysis. And then for pink, also there was no good stock analysis available. So um, yes, basically uh, it only showed up for Coho. 
as stock being something mm -hmm. important. And uh, we did see that there were like a number of rare pathogens in coho that are specific to some spots, which was not apparent in uh, other species. Is it possible um, to fall to follow up, say, on those coho at the, as they return the po you, know, you know the population? Uh, what was their um, you know parasite and pathogen load when they were back into the rivers to sort of do the subtraction um, to see what you know which ones survived? Um, I mean, yes and no. Um, you you know this is kind of the reason why we compared it to. The, what we see on the coast and then you can kind of say okay well on the coast we see more of this uh, pathogen and we don't see it out in the open ocean and vice versa but then you can have two explanation of why something doesn't show up either the fish have cleared the infections or these infections are actually so detrimental to the fish that those fish have dropped out of the population but I mean that is basically impossible to conclusively establish what of the two was the case. I mean, you run into the same scenario as with the predators that really you would have to track the fish all along their life cycle to figure this out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, question from Albina. Uh, Chris, awesome talk. Can you generalize, generalize whether salmon feel bad or okay in the Gulf of Alaska? Yeah, <laughs> so um, basically I would say that uh, based on what we've seen, uh, sockeye, and chum, specifically chum, were uh, hurting. They were seeming pretty hungry from uh, the data. And uh, the picture was really, like for uh, pink salmon, it was really varied. Some of them were feeling pretty good. Some of them were feeling pretty bad. Whereas coho seemed to be pretty robust. They don't seem to be too impacted by anything that's going on. Mm -hmm. So that is like a anthropomorphized summary of the data. <laughs> So I haven't got any other questions there, Brian. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then we are scheduled for a 10-minute break, and we start again at 6 o'clock. So uh, you are free to go for what's left, eight minutes. Thanks, Christoph. <laughs> Thank you.
And we're back. Are we connected, everybody in here? Okay, so our next speaker is Svetlana Esenkulova. And that Svetlana has worked with us at Pacific Salmon Foundation for a long time. And that, so Svetlana, I'll leave it over to you. Uh, hi, I'm Svetlana Esenkulova. I'm from the Pacific Salmon Foundation. And uh, this presentation is about squid catches in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors. Uh, Mikhail Zulov did ID in 2019, uh, Chris Dig did eDNA analysis, and he did lots of plotting for this um, presentation. And Alek Katogin's work uh, helped to put some of our results into perspective. So first things first, why squid is important to salmon? Based on salmon winter studies by uh, Russians, Japanese, and Americans, squid is a major food item for adult salmon. Squid is very nutritious and it contains lots of protein. In fact, they contain the most protein than other fish food sources. There is an agreement that squid is important for growth and survival of salmon in high seas. Uh, squid is particularly important food source for high trophic level species, coho, chinook, and steelhead. Uh, despite squid importance, very little is known about squid in high seas, and winter period is particularly understudied. Gulf of Alaska winter expeditions of 2019 and 2020 are the first major studies of squid in the Gulf of Alaska in the winter period. Uh, because this talk is mostly geared towards people who study salmon, I will start with uh, probably the most interesting piece of information for them. So was squid an important food source for salmon during our expeditions or not? So here are graphs on squid contribution to salmon diets. Uh, diet analysis was done on board by Russian team and for detail, uh, detailed data, you can refer to reports by Somov et al. and Pahomov et al. Uh, those charts show how much squid was in salmon stomachs. At the bottom of the charts are salmon species and number of stomachs analyzed. And from the start, you can see that squid was a major diet item in coho, chinook, and still had salmon. However, we only caught three chinook in 2019 and one still had in 2020. So this might be not a fair comparison between years. However, we caught a lot of coho in both years. So when we look at coho diet in 2019, squid contributed only 8%. And in 2020, it contributed 91%. So we go, if we go with the assumption that squid is a good food source, coho that we caught in 2020 would be doing better than the one in 2019. So from here, we can do an extra step for squid data and catches uh, and look what species of squid was the most important food item and if a squid was similarly important for all salmon size groups or not. So here are quite interesting results published by Somov in Russian language and another work also they're going to publish soon also in Russian language. So in 2020 for coho, squid was a major food source for fish sizes from 40 to 50 centimeters, but not smaller fish. They didn't do breakdowns of sizes in 19, but uh, there is a database, so it's possible to pull it out from there. In 2019, squid was important food component for larger, so kai, but not smaller. Uh, for the pie chart, I combined data for both years from database. There were a couple of hiccups with the uh, database, so those results might be not final, but it looks like that Akutania ananucha squid was the most important species in uh, salmon stomachs. So uh, uh, diet analysis for both expeditions 
agrees with previous findings uh, that squid uh, is an important food source for salmon. So squid is important for salmon, and now we can just move to catches of squid. So first, uh, I thought it would be important to mention that uh, most of the squid we caught at night, more than 90%. This is not a finding, and it's obvious for people who study squid and for crews who fish 24 hours, uh, squid is a vertical migrator. But I thought uh, it would be important to mention because some Canadian vessels don't fish 24 hours. Um, so if you don't, you will be missing uh, squid. Here, all of our catches data for both years. Between two years, we caught 12 taxa. Some species we caught only in one year, but not other. For example, in 2020, we caught uh, the Reatiotis apalescens squid, but not in 2019. Uh, the Reatiotis apalescens or Loligo apalescens also is a near shore squid and I'll be referring to it uh, in the uh, next slides. In 2019 we caught lots of Ganatos matakai but we didn't catch it in 2020. And interestingly we caught only one uh, small octopus, one specimen each year, uh, Gipatella diaphana. So when we combine all total catches uh, from trolls in a year, we have following charts. So total catches in 2019 were 2,300 squids, and in 2020 it was 1,600. Species composition of total uh, catch was quite different between those years. In 2019, the most frequently encountered squid was Bariateotis perialis, and it comprised over 80% of catches. In 2020, dominant species was Abreliopsis felis, and it was almost 50% of the total catch by numbers. In 2019, it was only 1%. Uh, in 2020, we set one elective uh, set, last set, very close to the shore to see if we can catch Chinook. We did catch Chinook. But because it was so close to Vancouver Island, we also got slammed with the uh, near shore squid, uh, Lolga Pleasant. And because we got so, 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 so many of it, uh, it affects our final numbers for 2020. But if we take this uh, near shore squid out on a second place by uh, numbers in 2020 would be Briateotis brialis and on third, um, Anichateotis briali japonica. And by the way, all those, the three most common species are uh, on this photo on a one tray. And you can see uh, here, this is a Briliopsis filis, uh, this is Briateotis brialis, and this is Anichateotis briali japonica. Uh, so if we compare um, those following charts, uh, distributions, the most common species we caught in 2019 and 20, uh, their distribution varied a lot. You can see that we had lots of Borealis in 19, but none in 2020, and we had lots of Abreliopsis in 2020, but not in 2019. And here are charts of squid catches by weight. In 2019, the most common squid dominated by both abundance and weight was uh, Borealis. In 2020, Abreliopsis dominated by numbers, but Borealis japonica dominated by weight, just because uh, it's such a large squid. And as I mentioned before, the nearshore squid uh, in 2020, um, if we take it out, uh, Felis would be in the second place and Borealis on third place for 2020. And here's kind of the same uh, message for weight. Briotis Borealis dominated by weight and catch numbers. Briliopsis Felis dominated by catch numbers in 2020, but Briotis Japonica 
by weight. So catches uh, in 2019 and 2020 were quite different, and there are a couple of potential reasons behind it. Uh, the first uh, one is obviously timing. Uh, in 2019, expedition was set earlier in the season, um, in February uh, 14 to March uh, 18th, and in 2020, it was from March 11th to April 7th. And on average, water temperatures were slightly cooler. We also used different vessels and nets, and the vertical opening in 2020 was shallower. In 2019, it was from 0 to 30, and in 2020, it was from 0 to 20. So in case of uh, Borealis, we probably just missed the layer it come up to. Um, squid occupied the layer from 20 to 60, and the opening was from 0 to 20. Here are surface water temperatures for the most common squid. I did maximum, minimum, and mean, and mean does take in, into account the number of species we caught at each temperature. Probably should have done box plots, but I didn't have time. So our message here is that Akutania was caught in warmer waters than other species. And Akutania is important because it's probably the most important for fish diets. And here's a context for Kutania from long-term studies. It's abundance uh, the highest in summer, drop in fall and winter, and rise in spring. And it appears to be associated with the Western uh, subarctic gyre. So we didn't catch a Kutania in 2019, and we caught it in 2020 and only in southern areas. Most of coho uh, that we caught in 2020 were caught in the same area as Akutania and Anucha. In 2019, Akutania was caught uh, after the Gulf of Alaska expedition was done and Kaganovsky was on its uh, way back to Russia. They just put a couple of uh, sets and they did catch Akutania there. Uh, during both expeditions, we took water samples for eDNA analysis. Methodology was uh, almost the same, except in 2020, there was an additional step. Um, we were rinsing with bleach deactivator. And samples were processed uh, at MGL following their standard procedure. So here are all squid eDNA results. And we can see right away that there are more hits in 2020 than in 2019. So this additional step with the sodium thiosulfate uh, played a role in it. So we have some good and some not so good matches with straw catches result for squid. Uh, some of the better ones are for calyx. Catches are on the lower graph and eDNA on the upper graph. And it's to species and genus level. Um, it agrees pretty much, and there is better detectability in 2020 than in 2019. And here are results for the most common species, Borealis and Boreatiotis. There are no eDNA results for Borealis filis because there is no sequencing data for the species in GenBank. So I'm sure once Chris finishes up his reports, papers, and presentations, he's probably going to do sequencing for this. Um, but actually, we do have a sample for voucher species. Potentially, we have both frozen and ethanol samples. So it is possible. Just the issue is time. Uh, so here with those maps, uh, you can see that there is less detectability in 2019 and better one in 2020, but it is still not perfect. Here are interpolation results for Briali Japonica. And actually, 2020 match between catch and eDNA is pretty good. And as uh, Chris actually mentioned yesterday, one of the benefits for eDNA that uh, we have detection for squid in eDNA samples in uh, day sets, as opposed to night sets uh, catches. So we, we, catch fit, uh, we catch squid only at night, but with eDNA, 
uh, there is a detection in both day and night samples. Uh, so in summary, squid was an important part of diets for coho in 2020. It's necessary to fish at night to capture squid. There were substantial differences in squid catches between years. Akutania Nanuchi was caught only in 2020 and in areas with high salmon catches. There is better agreement between eDNA catches in 2020 than in 2019, uh, but eDNA can be used very useful in distribution studies for squid. And squid studies are valuable addition to salmon studies. Uh, so that's all. Thank you very much. And I would like uh, to say uh, thank you for to organizers of the Gulf of Alaska expeditions, especially to uh, Beamish and Riddle. And I would also like to thank crews of the Gulf of Alaska expeditions 2019 and 2020, and special thanks going to co-chief scientist Somov and also uh, Dr. Albina Kanzaparova. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. We've got a few minutes for questions here, Mark. Have you seen anything yet? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, we've uh, managed to coax uh, Dick Beamish out of his den. Um, good job, Svetlana. What is the main diet of Okutania Anonicha? Uh, I don't know particularly for Okutania Anonicha, but squid uh, diet is uh, usually zooplankton, small fish. Okay, uh, and Evgeny's asking um, any comparison to coastal. Oh, that must be. I think sorry, that was a from the previous talk that uh, mm -hmm. came in later. Uh, so I've got a question, uh, Svetlana. To my to my eye, it it didn't look like the eDNA was uh, for most of the squid, even the, the most abundant one, was, was doing a particularly good job compared to what we saw yesterday uh, from some of the other uh, species, or maybe that was earlier today. Um, in one of your slides, you talked about sort of potential issues. Um, and is there something about squid, like not, not releasing an, a, a comparable amount of DNA into the environment that make it harder to detect? Uh, yeah, there is an issue with the eDNA shading, but I think also most of the time squid spend time in the deeper layers where the eDNA knows is from two to four meters. Right. So we have uh, another question from Sabrina. Hi, Svetlana. Nice to see you. Uh, could life history difference uh, attribute uh, attributed to differences in the... Sorry. Could life history difference attributed um, something in the grammar here to differences in the squid catches mm -hmm. uh, yes, do some species uh, they, have they do two have year life cycles sorry go uh, ahead yes they do have different life cycles and i wish uh, katagin was here to answer this question it's a really good one <laughs> i cannot answer it myself okay well we can take note of that and it's something we can uh, come back to people mm -hmm. If we're in between, I have a question that a lot of the uh, abundance that we've seen on the cruises, the squid really jump out as being highly abundant in a lot of our catches and that. Do people consider that when the abundance of squid come up, are they a competitor for food with salmon? I mean, they obviously are in the diet of salmon, but do could they have an effect where they outcompete salmon for certain types of foods? Mm. Well, squid usually preys on very, very small fish because squid itself is much smaller than salmon. But if they eat so so and, and small fish, yeah. Okay, yeah. we got a question, Mark? Go ahead. Yeah, I've got one from uh, Cameron Freshwater. Uh, great talk, Svetlana. <laughs> uh, two questions. Uh, are O. Borea, boreala japonica too large to be salmon prey? Sorry if I missed it in the earlier slides. Um, it is pretty large, but 
the question is not for size for uh, salmon and um, squid because in 2019 for example in mm -hmm. one of the stomachs we caught robusta which is very deep water uh, squid we didn't catch it in water uh, in trolls uh, but the size is about um, like it close to a meter uh, so if fish really wants to eat squid it would but briali chiponic is not really tasty <laughs> so that's why so, probably uh, uh, squid. Uh, that's why Akutania nanucci probably is a preferred uh, diet for salmon because even if people try so, uh, squid, uh, I was talking with people and they were saying that Akutania nanucci is actually one of the most tasty uh, squids for people too. Mm. And Briali Japonica is bitter. So there's a second question uh, similar to one that was asked earlier. Um, what's the potential for squid to compete with zooplanktivorous salmon such as pink and chum? It's a very good question. Very good That's question. Don't know the answer. <laughs> well done, Cameron. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Lori Whitecamp uh, uh, says, uh, great talk, Svetlana. I know you spent a long time with Mika identifying squid after every trawl. Are they hard to ID to species? When they are adult stages, it's really easy. When they're smaller, um, not so much. Uh, that is why actually I uh, was saying special thank you to uh, Somov and Kanzaparova uh, because they helped a lot for identification of squid in 2020. Yeah, I don't have anything uh, further, Brian. Okay. So it looks like we should uh, continue to pay attention to squid in the future cruises, and we'll have to think about what comparisons could be made, and soon we'll be looking at the diet of squid in detail. <laughs> okay, Svetlana, thank you very much. Um, I think we probably look like we have about three minutes in between and that Albina is ready to go, I expect. And she's going to talk about mctophids. So are we okay to proceed, fellas, or should we just wait? We're good to go. Albina, if you're ready to go, and then uh, I'll leave it to you. I'm Albina. Hello. Hello, everyone. I am Albina Kanziparova. I will be presenting my topics and apologize in advance for my pronunciation. Uh, abundant uh, abundant mesopelagic fish play an important role in the trophic structure of the ocean pelagic fish community both as zooplankton consumers and as a prey for predatory species. Myctophids and other small sites in the pelagic fish are a common food of salmon, cod, sea perches, squid, and heavily contribute uh, to diet of many cetaceans and seals. Uh, migrating from the sea, the pelagic play a significant amount of nature then you de decompose by bacteria and enrich the nutrients pool not far from the sea surface. From uh, these depths, organic and mineral matters are quickly returned back to the sea surface in appalling zones that maintain the ecosystem productivity. Recently, the role of mesopelagic fish fauna uh, was reassessed to show its significance uh, in the global carbon cycle in and vertical organic matter transport. That's why these fish received special attention during the winter Gulf of Alaska cruises in 2019 and 2020. Lack of data on this abundant group of fish inhabiting high seas pelagic realm was another impetus to study their distribution, abundance and ecology. The result of this finding is presented in the report. Uh, in 2019, a trail survey for overwintering Pacific salmon was conducted in the Gulf of Alaska on board the Russian research vessel Professor Kaganovsky. 
Last year, similar troll survey was conducted on board the Trolla Pacific Legacy. In 2019, was used standard minimal 10 mm cadent mesh size. Last year was used troll net similar to 2019, but with a smaller opening and 3 mm uh, cadent mesh size. In 2019, survey grid was more regular. Last year, 20 stations allocated eastward from 2019, so four stations uh, were committed uh, northward. That, very, uh, that area was not surveyed uh, last year. In this relation, uh, we analyze 2019 and 2020 uh, data sets on mesopelagic fauna as supplementing each other rather than providing an interannual comparison. Uh, Mike Toffits uh, were represented by four species, northern lampfish, California fed lightfish, big fin lanternfish, with well-expressed predomination of blue lanternfish. Last year, another mictophid species, uh, the eared black smelt, was recorded. It was rare, so we won't talk about it. Uh, in 2019, the total numbers of blue lanternfish uh, was higher than last year. Possible the blue lanternfish, while can uh, migrate up uh, to the sea surface, uh, do not likely concentrate near it in a stormy winter, and its distribution density is a high in the lower part of the layer swept during the troll fall. Calculated amounts uh, are the first estimate of blue lanternfish abundance in the northeastern Pacific Ocean. No quantitative estimates uh, for these species occurred in the literature. The northern lampfish was notably less abundant uh, in catches in 2019 than blue lanternfish. Last year, the northern lampfish also was the second most abundant mesopelagic species in the troll catches. Last year, the total numbers of California headlightfish was higher than in 2019. The big fin lanternfish was the least abundant nictophid. Uh, first, I'll tell about uh, the blue lanternfish. In 2018, the main catches of blue lanternfish were in the central part of the survey area. Last year, the three uh, big, biggest catches of blue lanternfish occurred at the southernmost, easternmost, and one of the westernmost stations. Uh, in 2019, blue lanternfish occurred in every uh, of the nighttime troll call and even in some pitches where the operation was finished or studied in the dust. Similar to 2019, it occurred in catch of every night troll call. Blue lantern fish numbers in catches in the dust were small, about uh, 10 fish per hour, while it was 1,000 fish per hour at night. Last year, similar to 2019, it occurred in catch of every night troll call. Size of blue lanternfish cat mostly depended on the time of the day than of geographic location. In 2019, average length of blue lanternfish in catches was about 7 mm. Last year, average length of blue lanternfish was about 5 mm and average body weight was almost twice less. This was a consequence of smaller mesh size in the troll net cadence last year. Last year, the sex uh, ratio on the sample the adult population was 30% males and 70% females. Uh, the larger blue lanternfish uh, specimens occurred uh, to be mature females with well-developed ovaries. It may be supposed uh, that this mycotophage uh, uh, will spawn throughout the survey area uh, in early spring. Uh, there is an uh, uh, assumption that blue lanternfish on the uh, year round, uh, but uh, larvae are most abundant in January March of the USA West Coast, in particular near the Oregon Coast. Even smaller northern lampfish occurred in the Houston uh, samples uh, collected by specialized net for sampling of microplastic part particles in upper 20 centimeters layer in 2019. No lantern fish of such small size were found in the troll catches besides, besides some smaller animals. Effusive uh, suggested shrimp, uh, caum jellies occurred there. 
probably blue lantern fish fry can avoid the Newston net with such a narrow vertical opening or do not keep themselves in the thin uh, near surface layer. Several blue lantern fish specimens uh, caught by the live fish trap in March 2019 demonstrated active escape behavior as in the fish box as in the laboratory cuvette tirelessly attempting to push themselves through the solid bottom. Uh, in the northwestern uh, Pacific Ocean, where research uh, vessel Professor Kodonovsky conducted a similar survey in January uh, 2018, uh, blue lanternfish also predominated in catches. Uh, after the survey in the Gulf of Alaska, Professor Kodonovsky conducted three trolls. Uh, the transect was located in the transit uh, dynamic frontal zone of mixing of subarctic and subtropical waters. As the share of blue lantern fish uh, decreased uh, to the southwest. At the first station, it was among the dominance, but at the third station, its share was not high and the abundance of the big fin lantern fish increased. The Gulf of Alaska looks to be at the edge of big fin lantern fish area. According to the literature, in the northeastern Pacific Ocean, some authors did not find blue lantern fish in catches or noted single fish. According to the data of Russian expedition in the northwestern Pacific Ocean, blue lantern fish dominated in 2018, 2010, and 2011, but in 2009 its share was low. Uh, next, I'll tell about uh, northern lamp fish. In 2018, northern lambfish uh, was less abundant in catches than in 2020. It occurred in seven troll catches in the northeastern part of the survey area. Last year, catches in the, of northern lambfish in uh, the northern part of the survey at sea surface temperature 7 degrees uh, were notably larger than in the southern part. Uh, last year, its catches occurred in 20 in 95% uh, of night sets with an average catch about 300 fish. In 2019, northern lambfish was caught only at night and catches were an average 50 fish per hour. A species was mostly represented by small size juveniles. In 2019, average length of northern lambfish was about 5 cm and last year average length was only 3 cm. A large proportion of fish, about 50% uh, to the small individuals with length no more than 3 cm due to the 3 mm mesh size in the troca dent. Smoke and Percy saw, showed that northern lambfish spawned the Oregon coast between December and March. The greatest uh, recruitment of juveniles in total samples occurs in November. Proceeding from assumption of lat uh, latitudinal it depends on spawning time and from significant catches of the youngest juveniles by troll in February and March 2018 and 2020. We can guess that northern lambfish spawn in the subarctic current area in late uh, winter spring, about one to two months later than near the Oregon coast, and the recruitment of juveniles into troll samples occurred in early spring. Juveniles will be taken away from the survey area by the northern branch of the subarctic current and then by the Alaska current to the Aleutian Islands waters uh, and the Bering Sea, younger and smaller fry will be delivered from the central North Pacific. Great abundance of northern lampfish uh, in the Bering Sea also testifies in favor of longer uh, period of spawning in the sub, uh, subarctic current area. Probably a uh, level of transport occurred in the southeastern Bering Sea from the south through the Aleutian passes. Uh, we think that transport with the Alaska current and then with the tidal currents in shore is responsible for northern lampfish currents in a relatively shallow icy strait and the glacier uh, base since it, it's uh, unlikely that fish can reproduce there. And next I, I'll tell about California headlight uh, fish and big fin lantern fish. In 2019, California had light fish occurred in six troll catches with the main catches in the central and south part survey area. Last year, California had light fish occurred in 15 out of 22 night sets. 
three specimens of uh, big fin lanternfish occurred in two troll catches near the southern and northern uh, boundaries of the area in 2019. In 2020, big fin lanternfish also was the least abundant. A mycophyte mycto was uh, present in eight of 22 night sets of the southern boundary of study area. In 2019, California headlight fish catches were on average 53 fish per hour. Its catches were only at night. In 2020, its average catches were lower. In 2020, Big Finland Lantern fish was an average catch only about one individual per night troll. In 2018, according to the length of California headlight fish, it's divided into uh, two groups. Probably the smaller group belongs to the southern and the larger to the northern part. Because we observed an identical group in the southern part of the survey area in 2020. Also, the average of southern groups is uh, the same in both years. Uh, comparing abundance and biomass estimates uh, for four common mycotophid species in the northeastern and northwestern Pacific uh, Ocean. We can conclude uh, that estimates are generally comparable for the expectation of some high-density spots revealed in the western side but did not fish uh, during two survey, surveys in the Gulf of Alaska. It should be also considered uh, that index of abundance uh, for the western side were calculated for the upper 50-meter layer uh, while uh, narrower layers were swept during the Gulf of Alaska survey in 2019 and 2020. Uh, despite exceptionally wide distribution of mycotophids, uh, their high abundance and vertical migrations uh, were a daily amplitude of several hundred meters. Their studies are fragmentary and insufficient, especially in the northeastern North Pacific Ocean. The Pan Pacific High Seas Expedition uh, has great potential to reveal a large picture of role of this unique group of forage fish in functioning of ocean uh, ecosystems. Detailed ecological research of the pelagic fish should be included into the cruise plans uh, of this expedition. Uh, I would like to thank you, the crews of both ships and the scientific teams for a good job. Thank you. Well, thank you, Albina. That was very well presented uh, and interesting. Vladimir, are you here to help with questions? Uh, yes. Okay, I can hear you fine. Okay. Albina, I note your recommendation for including more studies in the Trans-Pacific surveys this winter. So I'll take note of that one. Any questions yet, Mark? Yep. You oh, yeah, they're coming, coming in. Yeah, Evgeny's got one. Uh, nice talk, Albina. How would you explain the uh, presence of numerous small blue lanternfish in 2020 catches compared to 2019? Was it an indication of strong recruitment, or can it be explained by a different trawl configuration? OK, if I can start, I would like, of course, uh, say that uh, the smaller mesh insert in trawl, 3 millimeters versus the 10 millimeters in 2019, was the main reasons of, of uh, change in size distribution for uh, blue lantern fish. I think this uh, technical reason is uh, predominant. Uh, thank you, Vladimir. Uh, Dick Beamish, uh, excellent presentation. Do you think tar tarlet? I should be practicing these ahead of time. Tarlet. Tarleton benia uh, crenularis has uh, replaced steno stenobranchius uh, leucosaurus as the dominant pelagic fish species in the subarctic Pacific. And do you think that mctophids were not a major diet item of salmon? Or why do you think mctophids were not a major diet item of salmon? Okay, Mark, uh, maybe I would like to spend uh, 30 seconds for one funny uh, uh, history, one funny story from uh, my cruises. Siemens, uh, when they heard this name, Tarleton Binia, Crenualdaris, said that it's a very good view to check whether people is drunk or not. 
<laughs> okay, uh, I've, I've had a glass yeah, of wine. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no more wine. Yeah, but don't think I never will replace you know, Brachius Ligopsaros, uh, especially in the Bering Sea, since it's uh, too cold for it, for this species. And Stenobrachius found a very good uh, uh, biotope in the Bering Sea. It's a warm tra transitional layer, which uh, it spent uh, most of the uh, daytime and then going to cold to eat and going back to these uh, warm waters. But even these warm waters are uh, too cold for Tarleton Binia, I think. So it will remain the Pacific Ocean species and uh, will not penetrate uh, to Arctic as uh, some of Pacific salmon. Uh, why we have uh, less uh, Tarleton Binia in salmon diet? Uh, actually, as uh, Dick Wimish likes uh, to say, ask fish. But in my opinion, Tarleton Binia have uh, more masking color. It's uh, black with silver, so maybe not so easily detected uh, in uh, a dusk as uh, other uh, mycotid species. And uh, maybe it's the main reason of, of that, but of course, I'm not safe for sure. So uh, uh, um, Dick was actually asking about uh, why mctophids in general were not a major diet item. Um, so thoughts there, Vladimir? Yeah, yeah. I asked uh, answered about Tarleton binia since it is okay. the most common species. Uh, most common. But okay. Actually, in the Bering Sea, it's a mctophid. That's a very important component of uh, salmon diet, and of course, not only for salmon, for other large fish like walleye pollock and uh, so the ground fish species uh, for many of them. Interesting. Uh, question from Jackie. Um, the biomass estimates and total number of blue lanternfish in 2019 is exceptionally large but you've not provided confidence intervals. Um, just curious, are the confidence intervals relatively large or small? Yeah, for abundant species, uh, species like Tarleton Binia, the confidence interval is uh, acceptable. But of course, for rare species, it's uh, too big and even more than our abundance estimates. Uh, when we will prepare this uh, paper to publication, of course, we will present uh, all confidence intervals and errors limits. Okay. So, uh, no other no other questions online right now. Okay, we'll just give it a second, see if somebody comes in. Otherwise, we'll have a more extended break. We have a break planned after this talk, anyhow. Uh, so, if the if we don't have more questions right now, uh, we can just oh. simply break. You got one. Yeah, well, me. <laughs> I'm just uh, uh, yeah, ignorant of, of the uh, of the life history. So, um, do we know the age of these fish? Uh, are they sort of uh, do they sp spawn multiple years? And and am I right, Albina, in that you were uh, suggesting that that cycle uh, is an annual cycle from around you know in, around the entire um, you know uh, North Pacific um, in one year for those fish? Uh, yeah, I would like to say that we have some data and the published data. They are a little bit contradictory. We will touch that a little bit in uh, considering the northern lump fish, uh, since it uh, actually uh, different opinions uh, exist uh, in which age uh, Sinovacus lecapsarus uh, can be entered the Bering Sea. But uh, actually, we can consider these uh, fish as a relatively short time living, uh, like uh, in average about three, four years, not more. And of course, it's not uh, this big route uh, across the Bering Sea and going back to Pacific is not for one year. It definitely should take uh, at least two years and even more. Okay, and uh, Beamish is coming back with a follow-up saying, talk some more about why mctophids that are abundant are not prey of species such as coho. 
Uh, I only guess, but uh, of course, I don't know for sure. Uh, actually, if uh, we will um, look on our data in the Western North Pacific, where the mycotoxic fauna is much di diverse, much more diverse, uh, we also could not find a lot of Tarlitombinia in salmon uh, stomachs. But for other species uh, like uh, northern lungfish and uh, California daylight fish or relative species, they occur much more frequent. So that it was uh, since my guess that the Tarlitombinia maybe have. Uh, more suitable color, color to hide uh, themselves in the darker environment in the ocean. That's all the questions we've got, Brian. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, well, let's just take another uh, break. Our next talk will be at 7 o'clock. Uh, yes, yeah, 7 o'clock. And Svetlana will be uh, providing that for us again. So back at 7 o'clock Pacific time.
Uh, hello again. Um, this presentation is about using temperature anomalies in forecasting in Kamchatka. Um, and I'm Svetlana Zinkulova. I'm from the Pacific Salmon Foundation and I'm presenting on behalf of Dr. Bugayev and his co-authors. Uh, Bugayev, Feldman and Tipnin are from Kamchat Miro and uh, Rachenko is from NPFAC. Uh, so the foundation of this work is based on decades of data. Um, this graph shows salmon catches from the Russian Far East between 1925 and 2020. And on average, over this almost 100 years, annual catches in the Far East were about 170,000 tons. Kamchatka stock contribution is about 65% or 110,000 tons. Salmon catches consisted of about 60 to 70% of pink salmon, 25% of chum, 10% sockeye. Uh, Pacific salmon uh, that are other species contributed less than 5%. Uh, in recent decades, uh, catches of Kamchatka salmon increased substantially. And it appears that at the end of the 20th, beginning of 21st century, um, there is a historic peak of Pacific salmon abundance in Kamchatka. Pink salmon has a short cycle and its dynamics generally depends on the environmental drivers. It's a major commercial salmon in Russia and it needs precise forecasting. In Kamchatka, forecasting is mostly based on two models, Ricker model, spawner recruitment, and siblings method. Um, math modeling is always limited, limited by predictors and issues with the forecasting of salmon can be critical. Uh, that is why Russian scientists are always looking to improve forecasting models. From 2016, forecast of pink salmon in Kamchatka is done using multiple regression model. It takes into account survival rates, conditions of reproduction, and early marine period. From 2018, the model was enhanced with the method of random forest or random decision forest. Uh, climate indices that are used in both methods are Pacific Decadal Oscillation, Index of Cyclonic Intensity in the West Pacific, and Arctic Oscillation. Over the course of studies of climate factors and salmon abundance, it was found that many parameters co-correlate. And in overwhelming majority of cases, the key factor was the planetary global temperature anomaly. And the purpose of this research was to test index of the sea surface temperature zonal abnormalities in simulation of the Pacific salmon abundance forecast in Kamchatka. Here are zones of fall and winter feeding of Pacific salmon in Kamchatka. They are very well explored by regional specialists. Fall area is on the map A and winter feeding area is on the map B. Uh, blue lines are for East Kamchatka stocks and red lines are for West Kamchatka. Uh, the squares or cartographic trapezoids are used to calculate temperature anomaly. Squares are five by five degrees. Uh, data on uh, temperature is taken from NOAA, British Meteorological Bureau and US National Centers of Ecological Prognosis. Salmon catches are from Kamchatniro and NPAFC. Pearson correlation um, was calculated between temperature anomaly and cage abundance. Time lag for pink salmon was one year, chum for five years, and sockeye three, four years.
Uh, here is a graph uh, showing data for global temperature anomalies and Pacific uh, salmon catches in Far East between 1925 and 2020. Correlation is strong and significant. Correlation of salmon catches with global temperature anomaly is 0 0.78 and with the northern hemisphere anomaly 0 0.82. Similar results were demonstrated in previous studies, and there are a number of Russian publications on this topic. Authors of this work present results built upon previous research, and they also include data for recent period from 1971 to 2020. Uh, this is a busy slide. It has a lot of information, but I will try to walk you through this and just um, uh, give you some highlights. Um, those results demonstrate that most of statistically significant correlations are moderate from 0 0.3 to 0 0.6. Uh, there is correlation between most of the salmon species and areas of fall feeding, especially September. There is less correlation in winter. And also correlation is higher in some squares and lower in others. Correlation between temperature anomalies and catches in regards to spatial structure and patterns of feeding migration during salmon first year at sea cannot be random. The systematic regularity of the distribution of the significant correlation for all species implies that water temperature does affect salmon stock abundance in Kamchatka. As for the correlation strength, which is moderate, it is expected uh, that explanatory power in this case would be moderate because a hydrological factor affect fish production indirectly uh, through food availability and predation. Uh, here is an example of temperature anomalies for the squares where the correlation between temperature and catches were the highest. There is substantial interannual variability of September temperatures, and there is a clear trend towards an increase in this indicator in the period from 1971 to 2020. Um, this is consistent with the overall dynamics of the catches of Pacific salmon uh, from Kamchatka for the same time period. During uh, this increase in catches, the temperature anomaly varied from minus 1.5 to plus 2 degrees. And here are charts with the relationship between salmon catch and temperature anomalies in September. It's for the squares of mass feeding migration for salmon in its first year of marine stage for years from 1971 to 2020. Charts on the left are for Eastern Kamchatka and charts on the right are for Western. Correlations are significant but moderate. Um, so once again, temperature should be considered only as an indicator. The graph also shows that maximum catches were observed at the uh, 0 0.5 to 2 degrees positive anomalies. Also, I have a little bit more time, so I need to mention that authors played with the time lags uh, for long uh, life cycle salmon, cham and sokai, and in case of Kamchatka, uh, they say that lag for all the salmon can be four years. It's because most of the Kamchatka returns for those species consist of spawners that spend three years at sea. Significant moderate correlation between temperature anomalies and catches in a large part of the fall feeding area suggests its high potential in multivariate forecast modeling in Kamchatka. Uh, further statistical uh, exploration could determine the most active periods and zones, and that will allow temperature anomaly series to be included in multivariate regression model and random forest analysis along with other climatic indices. Uh, this and the next slide are showing results for pink salmon in odd and even years. 
Those slides are the last ones before summary. Uh, and authors here showed that temperature anomaly is an important indicator. And in theory, the conditions of the habitat should have the same effect on fish of both generations, but high or low abundance of particular generation can have an additional effect on pink salmon survival. Uh, natural mortality depends on population density, food availability, and predators. And this is why forecasting for pink salmon is often made separately for odd and even years fish. So th those charts show correlation for temperature anomaly and pink catches. And next slide shows the same results, but catches are on logarithmic scale. For Western Kamchatka, there is correlation for even years but not for odd years. Most likely odd generations of pink salmon are influenced by other factors. And current hypothesis is those factors are within coastal ecosystem. Pink salmon from Eastern Kamchatka show correlation for both generations, for, uh, for odd and even years. Odd years 0 0.56 and even years 0 0.55. Uh, the logarithmic scale uh, substantially increased correlation for Eastern Kamchatka to 0 0.62 and 0 0.75, respectively. And it slightly increased correlation for Western Kamchatka for even year salmon from 0 0.41 to 0 0.54. Overall, these results reveal some additional possibilities in the modeling work. So in summary, sea surface temperature zonal abnormalities is a promising factor for simulating salmon abundances in Kamchatka. There are significant correlations between salmon catches and temperature anomalies in the zones of early marine migrations of juveniles in fall and winter. Those results suggest a possibility of the use of temperature anomaly series for math modeling to forecast salmon returns in Eastern and Western Kamchatka using the multiple regression model and random forest model. Kamchatniro continue working on studies in this area. And I believe that Vladimir Achinka, who is co-author of this work, will be available to answer questions for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. That? I got cut off. Can you hear me fine? I yeah. can. Yep. OK, good, good. <laughs> and there's Mark. All right. Here I Thank am. you, Svetlana. That was a difficult one for you to go through, I'm sure. So well done on that. Mark, any questions to yeah. start? Well, I'm going to start with one. Um, I haven't got anything yet on the, uh, on the monitor here. Um, Svetlana, I, this last year, couple of years have been a pretty dramatic downturn for uh, East Kamchatka stocks. Um, have these uh, climate-based indices that appear to be quite uh, strong, have, have the correlations held up um, during this uh, period of, uh, of change that we're seeing in the, in the past couple of years? Uh, Vladimir will answer this question. Okay, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> yeah, it's a good question. Um, maybe somebody remember we collaborate with Alexander and uh, presented some talk uh, at the workshop in 2017. And after that, we have this enormous uh, run to, of pink salmon to the western Kamchatka. It's a great catch, uh, more than 300,000 metric tons, you can imagine. And if they had more processing fertilities, maybe it will be 500,000 metric tons. Nobody knows. But after that, of course, the oil coefficients uh, deteriorated a little bit, and uh, some of them significantly. So we can now say that temperature definitely is a good indicator. It's a general indicator which uh, influences all processes in our nature. But for these unusual events in the last couple of years, 
in Kamchatka, you know, maybe last year it was uh, again an expected low approach of pink salmon to eastern Kamchatka coast. Uh, some other factors uh, influence. So, of course, coefficients uh, went down a little bit. But uh, Alexander is still optimistic to find uh, some correlations and other indices uh, which will help them forecast uh, pink salmon run well. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, I don't have anything else uh, showing. Well, it was interesting to me that there was only one of the four comparisons, yeah, East and West Kanchaka, even an odd year, and you only had one that was a negative relationship. And it's interesting why it would be striking like that. But is it implying that there's a, another controlling factor I mean, you sort of reference this in the sense that there are multiple factors involved, but uh, it still seems odd to me that it would be only one of the four comparisons that would be negative. Uh, yes, it's uh, also a very interesting question. My, uh, mainly we had uh, such uh, comparison between East and West Kamchatka since it was initiated by people who live in Kamchatka. <laughs> so they every year monitor approaches to West and the East Coast. But for a long time, we had uh, some uh, enigmatic situation on the Western Kamchatka. You likely know the pink salmon uh, predominated before on the Western Kamchatka in odd years. And uh, it was a big expectation for pink salmon run in 1985 and as big expectation as a uh, big failure. All catch uh, processing fleet waited for pink salmon, but uh, catch was uh, almost uh, nothing comparing to expectations. And for a long time, uh, actually no explanation. And the typical explanation from Kamchat neuroscientists that in 1983, it was a very big run and big escapement. Uh, so, Reproduction was bad due to a lot of uh, dead fish in uh, spawning rivers, uh, which deteriorate environment. And after that, it was a very long consequences for this uh, ODA generation. But uh, relatively recently is what found that the same year, 1985, it was an unexpectedly big approach and big catch on the southern Kurils. It's a thousand kilometers from the Western Kamchatka coast, but it happens and also have no any explanation. If people can uh, cite that earlier, maybe it will be more evidences to find and to analyze. So right now we're just uh, monitoring and uh, uh, analyzing this situation. And uh, you know that uh, it's uh, also big changes. And um, in several regions of the Okhotsk Sea uh, Basin, the predominated uh, generation of pink salmon changed to opposite. In the eastern Sakhalin, the previously predominated uh, ODS generation going down, the still event generation keep uh, itself on a good level, relatively good level, of course. In uh, Hokkaido, we also observe the same. So the large-scale process is going. So we still have no good explanation, but we should monitor that and uh, hmm. think about it. So we have a question from uh, Tetiana Ross. Uh, nice talk. I'm wondering if you could speculate on how the relationship with anomalous sea surface temperature will change when the normal sea surface temperature changes? That is, what is the relative importance of the anomaly uh, versus the mean? I actually, mm. yeah, you know, this uh, <clears throat> using anomaly, it's uh, usually uh, more well displays changes. So when we analyze some uh, uh, fluctuations in situation, highly fluctuating. We usually use the anomalies instead of the normal value. And uh, I am not very re responsive for this uh, part of this scientific work. Since we have a discussion with uh, Alexander, 
and I suggested him to use the heat budget of uh, what ocean instead of uh, surface temperature. In my opinion, this more general uh, characteristic uh, that can characterize the biotope for salmon, especially in high seas, but he still continue working with his uh, SST. So likely that is an answer to the question. Well, it may also, Vladimir, have something to do with the mean will not change very much on an annual basis. You have 30 years of data in your mean already. So it's going to take a number of years to change the mean. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I understand the question in the sense it's the variation versus the magnitude of the effect and that, but uh, okay. Anything else, Mark, as we move on here? Uh, just a quick question from me, uh, Vladimir. What do you think um, we will learn in uh, from surveys like 2022 uh, that could improve this, uh, this indexing uh, and forecasting? Uh, first of all, we will found and uh, we will have more clear <clears throat> pattern of distribution of all salmon stock in the winter in area. So when we will have the whole, whole pieces of this big puzzle, of course, it will be much more answers to such questions. Now we only can guess where pink salmon go, where cocker go, and with what speed it can redistribute through the area. But when we will have this one big uh, one time shot for the whole North Pacific, I think we can, will have much more data for that. Thank you. Any questions there, Mark? No, I have a comment, no, that's there's it. Nothing. No, there's one of the things else, we man. should probably, one thing we should capture from our discussions is remembering what Dr. Beecham said yesterday. Even if we don't have a sufficient baseline at this time, part of our program could include collecting baseline uh, in 2022 and 2023 if we have to, and then you could do the back calculation. Uh, but for some of the species, we won't have sufficient resolution, depending on the geographic, uh, what scale that you're interested in. Uh, that, but, so we might wanna make sure we capture that for recommendations moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. And I also would like to say thanks to Svetlana for performing this great, great presentation of such complicated talk. Yeah, we've got a new job for you, Svetlana. You're going to be our new <laughs> analyst. <laughs> okay, is that it? And that? Yeah. Okay, many thanks, Svetlana and Vladimir. Thanks for your help. Um, we are just a little ahead of time. Oh boy, are we okay to proceed with Chris? And Chris, are you available? Chris is ready. Okay, well, let's move on. Thank you very much, folks. Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here. And since I get to start a few seconds early, I am just going to comment that I was really looking forward to go, going to Russia for this symposium, but I'm really grateful that Dick and Brian found a way that we could all come together online during these COVID times. So it's, it's great to be here. Um, this evening I'm going to be, or this morning, wherever you are, I'm going to be talking about sockeye salmon and what we have learned about sockeye salmon from the two expeditions. And specifically, I'll be focusing on Canadian sockeye and Dick Beamish is the co-author on this presentation. So before we even started these expeditions, we had some questions that we were asking. The first one was, is broodier strength of sockeye salmon determined by the end of the first marine winter? And, you know, there's accumulating evidence to suggest that this is the case, but this was an opportunity to actually go out there and sample salmon immediately after that first ocean winter. And the second was, can we use the surveys to provide some early forecast or early information on subsequent returns to coastal systems, and especially for sockeye salmon? So I'm going to talk about where we are with, with both of these. And I'll also be bringing up some other points of, of interest or additional questions that have, that have arisen during these first two years. So this is a figure of sockeye salmon returns to the Fraser River 
in British Columbia from 1952 to 2019. And um, I'm showing this because it is our most important uh, sockeye producing river in, in Canada and probably the most important sockeye fishery in, in Canada. Um, you'll see from this figure that there's a cyclic pattern to the returns, which is based on a four year cycle. There was a high return in the early 2000 and, and uh, sorry, 1990s, and it declined um, over the following years to a low in 2009. And that initiated the Cohen inquiry in Canada to look at this declining trend. And at the end of spending millions of dollars, the judge determined that there was no smoking gun to explain this. What was interesting is in the subsequent year, 2010, we actually had the highest return on recorded history. However, since then, the returns have continued to decline and there is even more of a cyclic, pa cyclic pattern with the Adams year being dominant. But in 2019 and 2020, we had the lowest returns on record to the Fraser River. And these just happened to be the years that we were doing the survey. So let's take a look at what we actually caught in the Gulf of Alaska. In 2019, we had 73 sockeye caught and almost half of those were identified as Bristol Bay. We also had a component about a quarter from Southeast Alaska and some from the transboundary rivers. These are rivers that flow through the Alaska Panhandle and then into Canada. The British Columbia catch was about 17% with half of them from the Fraser River. In 2020, the 51 sockeye caught showed a different pattern. There was no Bristol Bay sockeye in this catch, although still about 25% or 26% were from Southeast Alaska and 6% transboundary. Now we had 56% of the catch from BC and it was still about a 50% proportion to the Fraser River. What was interesting is we also caught some sockeye from Southeast Kamchatka and the Columbia River. And I'll talk about those as well. The pattern of catch in the two years in 2019, um, the, the catch was dominated in the north, north of 52 no north, excuse me, and especially in that northwest quadrant. Unfortunately, we weren't able to fish there in 2020, be both because of weather and because of COVID. However, in general, in the areas that we could fish, the sockeye were caught in the more northern regions of our sampling area. We were really fortunate in 2019 that the Professor Kagagnoski and the Russian science team was able to conduct a survey on it, their way to pick up the team in Vancouver. And these are the sets in which they caught sockeye in that year. And what was interesting for us is that in the Central Pacific, 13% of their catch was from Canada. And I'll include those in the talk today. So now I've combined all of the sockeye from both years. These are 2019 and 2020 sockeye. And what I wanna just look at is the overlap with pink salmon. Um, in total, we had 124 sockeye caught in these sets. What is interesting is that when we take a look at the pink catch, these are the, the ovals in green now, and we had 157 or uh, pink salmon caught in total there it really is not overlap in the concentrated areas of both these species. In fact, in the area where there is overlap in of the two ovals, it only represents about 6% of the pink and, sam and sockeye catch. So even though the diets of these species may overlap, um, there's minimal overlap in their distribution during the winter. And this is important because there is a thought that there is competition between these tr these two species, but truly in the winter time with this distribution pattern, that any competition would be minimal. Okay, now I'm gonna switch to taking a look at our Canadian sockeye catch. These are all surveys. So the 2019 and 2020 Gulf of Alaska um, surveys and the Central Pacific Survey conducted by the Professor Kagavnoski. And these are the sets where Canadian sockeye of Canadian origin of any age class were captured. What's interesting is this most, most westerly catch. It's 4,000 kilometers away from the BC coast. And when we took a look at stock ID, this fish was actually a Chilco Lake sockeye salmon. 
So this fish was about 5,000 kilometers away from its ocean entry point, assuming that it moved north through Johnson Strait. Um, Chilco Lake Sockeye, I've identified these with green stars, were found throughout the study area. So from the most coastal sets in 2020, right through to the central Pacific. And now I'm going to switch and take a look at those ocean age one coho salmon. Now these, these coho are important for considering the, the, uh, um, if brood year strength is determined in that first ocean winter. And again, there is a broad distribution of these juveniles to over 3000 kilometers off the BC coastline. And what's important about this is that if that first marine winter is critical for determining brood strength, it's not just that the fish have to accumulate energy stores for that winter, but they also need the energy to undertake these really broad migrations. And we need to consider that when we're looking at factors that are regulating survival. Now there's been many, um, several uh, conceptual models of how sockeye move around or into the North Pacific. And this is probably the most reach, uh, recent from Beecham et al. 2014. And they suggested that some of the sockeye salmon uh, juveniles were moving into the coastal areas to overwinter. And that obviously is true because they were catching them in, in those regions. But what we're seeing from our surveys is that they're also overwintering well into the Gulf of Alaska and Central Pacific. And the catch per unit effort in these areas in the winter were higher than the winter coastal surveys. Now I want to jump back for a second to talk about species or stocks from all countries. And um, these, the, the blue and the, the red outlines are adapted from Myers et al for the North American and blue and the Asian sockeye salmon distribution patterns. And first of all, I'm going to bring up this Chilco River sockeye again, which I already talked about. And um, it is within the, the parameters identified for North American sockeye. But as far as we can tell, it's the most westerly um, report of a Fraser River sockeye salmon. Second, I want to talk about these purple um, triangles in the Gulf of Alaska. These fish were identified as originating from the Gulf of Alaska. They, sorry, <laughs> from, they were in the Gulf of Alaska. They were identified as originating from Eastern Kamchatka and they were caught in three different sets and they were both uh, first year age class. So first winter at sea and second winter at sea fish. Finally, and, and I think that these are likely the most easterly recorded um, for, for, for these stocks. I also want to bring up the blue, which is a Columbia River sockeye salmon. And we're not, exp on a, or we're not surprised to see this in the Gulf of Alaska. It, it was a one-year-old fish, but I just wanted to highlight this to remind people that what we're seeing in, in the Gulf of Alaska is fish from as far south as the Columbia River through BC, Southeast Alaska, Bering Sea, and right to um, Southeast Kamchatka. So it really is a mixing ground for all of these stocks. So in summary, oh, sorry, one more thing. This is the question, um, one of the questions that arose from the expedition and it was on age class. And there was a big difference in the age class that we saw in 2019 and 2020. 40% of the catch in 2019 were identified as third winter at sea. And these were, um, represented from all areas, Bristol Bay, Southeast Alaska, BC, and even the Fraser River. This age class was not common in 2020. And in fact, only one fish has been, has been verified to be an age three. I should mention that all these ages were initially conducted um, looking at the scales by Alexia and Albina and have subsequently been verified by the aging lab at PBS and by Dick Beamish. So the, the question for the difference here for everyone to think about is, is this difference between years due to a difference in the abundance of the salmon in the Gulf of Alaska, or has it something to do with differences in ocean conditions? Okay, now to the <laughs> conclusions on distribution. So Canadian sockeye were distributed from the coast shelf to 4,000 kilometers to the west. 
And the Ocean Age 1 sockeye dis were distributed from the shelf to about 3,000 kilometers. And I actually did an area on that, and it was about 2 million, uh, 2 million kilometers squared for the juvenile Canadian sockeye. Sockeye and pink salmon distribution, distributions did not overlap in the winter, suggesting little competition between these two and possible expansions of, of both Canadian and Russian sockeye salmon distributions. Okay, now I'm coming back to this figure on, on Fraser River sockeye returns. And I'm, I'm doing this because this is our most important sockeye fishery and possibly our most important fishery in Canada. And we just happened to be starting these expeditions in the two years that we had the poorest returns in, in recorded history. And Dick and I think that um, our surveys may have given us an early indication of this. So the next few slides are going to be a thought process. I recognize that the numbers we're looking at are small, but we need to start thinking outside the box and seeing what some of these numbers might mean. Are they real? Are they giving us an indication of something? And so let's just walk through these um, a little bit. Okay, this is what Alexi presented yesterday, and that was that there was 9 million sockeye in the expedition from the expedition estimated in the Gulf of Alaska, and about 8 million of these would have returned um, to their natal streams in 2019. Just using the proportion determined from stock DNA, about 1.1 million of those would have been BC sea salmon, and about 620 million thousand of those would have been identified as Fraser River sockeye. So I understand that there is discomfort in looking at these numbers or how we use these numbers. This was the first expedition and we really did not know what this meant. But it was kind of interesting because that was pretty close to what actually returned to the Fraser River. So we said, how else could we look at this to see if we could get some relative abundances and, and determine if there's any confidence in some of these estimates? So the first thing we did is we said, let's take a look at the age two sockeye salmon. Nine of them returned in 2019 and five or 55% of them were from the Fraser River. At the same time, there were two Skeena River fish. And if we combine Fraser and Skeena, Fraser would have represented 71%. So we said, how did that compare with returns in 2019? And if we only look at the cycle lines, remember that cyclic pattern that we saw in the, in the returns, so the 2019, 2015, 2011 returns and compared Fraser River returns in those years to total BC, the Fraser River represented 46 to 49 percent of the returns. If we compared it just with the Skeena River for the 2019 returns, Fraser River represented 20 percent. Now, this gives an, an, a suggestion, these numbers are small, but that the proportion of Fraser River age two sockeye in the survey was similar, kind of around the ballpark of what we would have expected to see in, based on returns. 2020, we didn't get enough age two to do anything with, except I will say when we move now to the age one sockeye from Canada, in 2019, we got very few age one Canadian fish as well, which kind of matches with the very few age two Canadian fish in 2020. What we did see in 2020 was a large increase in catch in the age one component of Canadian fish. So it increased about 10 times. And 15 of these fish were identified as originating from the Fraser River, which would represent about 58% of the catch was Fraser River stock. Comparing using the same cycle lines, again, this now has moved to the 2020 cycle line when these fish would, would return, in general, the Fraser River represents 52% of BC returns in those years. This is still general. And we thought, okay, is there something else we can look at that would give us a little bit more uh, definition or, or clarification? We said, let's take a look at Fraser River specifically. So there's four run timing groups to the Fraser River in BC, early Stewart, early summer, summer and late run stocks. And we had 15 Fraser River age one fish in the 2020 expedition. And 80% of these were summer run fish, 13% were late run fish, 7% were early summer fish, and we didn't see any early Stewart fish. Now these fish have not returned, they come back this fall. 
But if we look at their parental spawning escapement in 2017, there was 72% summer, 14% late, 11% early summer, and 3% early steward. So overall, in general, this suggests that the survey is sampling a representative sample of stock mixtures for BC and specifically for the Fraser River. Again, I recognize that these numbers are small, um, but, the, but the question is, does this increase in age one catch in 2020 suggest an improved return in 2021? And Dick and I think that it does. We think that the return in 2021 will be greater than 2019 and 2020. We don't know by how much or what the number will be, but that there will be an improvement. And I think Dick is willing to put a bottle of wine on the line for that. Um, what it'll also mean if there is this increase in returns in 2021 is that it will be additional evidence that the first winter is determining brood year strength because these are the fish that have just survived that first marine winter. So in summary, the two surveys provided new information on the ocean life of sockeye, and I've gone through that. But more important, the stock composition of British Columbia sockeye salmon from the surveys appears representative of the expected stock returns to BC rivers for both the age two and the age one fish. And if the returns of the Fraser River in 2021 are higher than 2019 and 20, it may be the first validation or moving towards being able to use these surveys as an early forecasting tool. And what we really need is a survey in some years with really high returns to have that comparison between the low return years and the high return years. It will also be an indication um, with improved returns in 2021 that the brood year strength for sockeye salmon is determined in that first ocean and it should say winter. So that's it. Thanks very much. Can't hear you, Brian. Oh, that's because I muted myself for a change. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't bring up 2022 return because if we see no sockeye returning in 2022 for the famous Adams River return, um, I think well, everything's going to fall apart. That's what they're going to be sampling. Uh, we, we weren't out there this year, right, to sample the age one fish for the 2022 return. So they'll be sampling um, the the returning fish next year when, when they go up, when the expedition occurs. And we do get out, yeah. Okay, Mark, hey, over to you. Yes, yeah, so we've got a question from Albina. What is your expectation for 2021 sockeye returns? Sorry if I missed it in your talk. Um, we think for the Fraser River, it'll be higher than 2019 and 2020. Um, we don't know how much higher, but that's the one that Dick has the bottle of wine that I think he's willing to put some money on. So. If indeed the age one fish are indicative of what, what is going to come back. Now, Chris, uh, just wondering um, what you're thinking is with the 2020 survey not going into that northern part of the 2019 survey area where uh, it was predominantly sockeye. And I, I can't remember uh, what you saw in that northern part. Um, how, how does that relate to your proportions that you're looking at? How do you think um, not having that survey area in 2020 to the north has impacted your what you're looking at? I think overall the catches would have been larger. However, within any set, there is a really strong mixture of stocks. And mm. I think that's one of the one of the things that's coming through here is even though the catch numbers are small, it, it's they're not grouped. They're not they're not bunched up by stock or origin. So th th we're getting a representative, even though it's a small sample, a representative sample in what in what we're seeing. So overall, the numbers would have increased even more. But um, that's all I can say. Okay. Uh, Lori Whitecamp says, great talk, Chris. How much of the extension of ranges across the Pacific is due to using genetics for stock ID versus traditional tagging studies? Good question, Lori. Oh, and wow. that that's um, an interesting question. And I think that next year, 
having this pan pacific study and being able to sample right across the, the pacific will be a benefit um a huge benefit to be able to to see what is there genetically um it, because maybe uh, they've all right doing though this. yeah or maybe it's it's uh something that's doing to do with the climate that's causing an expansion and range of some of these fish I should mention we do have the samples from 2009 um, and just because of COVID they haven't been rerun but they've been sent to Canada to be rerun on our baseline so uh, right now it only indicates that there's sockeye from the north or sorry the like Alaska BC we haven't we can't differentiate specifically where those fish are from so it'll be interesting when we can rerun those and see if there's any BC stocks in the Central Pacific in 2009. Chris, I'm, I'm I couldn't keep it together as I was looking at all the the uh, what you were seeing there. Um, how spread out are the are the fish that are returning in that year? Um, in terms of, I, I'm always amazed that they're covering this great range. And yet they're coming back in a fairly tight, um, you know, return curve uh, into the approaches. Uh, what does that look like in terms of how far apart those returning fish are in that year? Well, I've, like the the one slide that I showed you of where the Chilco, that Chilco fish that mm -hmm. was most westerly was a two-year-old fish. Now it could be that that would be one of the small, you know, the small percentage of Fraser River fish that come back after three winters. Um, we we don't know that, um, but it's a long distance. I think it's even more remarkable that the juveniles are all the way out there because mm -hmm. that's a long way for a juvenile salmon to get in, you know, eight or nine months. Mm -hmm. Mark, the topic you're bringing up on run timing came up several times as I talked to people about the recent returns of salmon from Alaska through the Columbia River. And there were a number of instances in 2020 where the returns were very different timing, up to about two weeks different. And run timing is very conserved in most populations. Uh, I think it's something that uh, it came up regularly enough that I've included in my talk tomorrow that I think we should start taking a look at this because this could be indicating a change that we're simply not really picking up on at this time. Mm -hmm. Uh, fascinating uh, work, Chris. I, I don't have any more questions uh, on the board here. Good. Good. Uh, Chris, <laughs> just uh, something that you didn't bring up, and I'm wondering where we're at. Uh, so for the Salish Sea work and then out into the Pacific, you are going to be looking at otoliths and daily growth rings and stuff. Mm -hmm. Is that analysis still ongoing? It's still ongoing. It's been delayed because of COVID and we need to get some of these samples to Alaska. So um, it, it's it's not out the window and it will be done before the expedition. Uh, we're hopeful, but that is part, I mean, that's the validation of the, of the first ocean winter as well as taking a look at some of those fish and also taking a look at that early growth pe um, period of the juveniles that move well out into the Pacific compared to those ones that stay near the near shore. Um, if they had variability in that early marine growth period. Okay, Mark, anything left there on your screen? Any questions? Uh, yes, I got one more from Sam saying, you've shown that there's less overlap between pink and sockeye than we originally thought. Does this change anything in how these two species are managed? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think we use their, their distribution in any management at, at present. Unfortunately, we use very little of what happens in the ocean in our management of, of salmon, um, at least in, in, this, in the high seas component of their, of their life. So, no. I don't know if you think anything different, Brian. No, but it could change how we manage in the sense that if you go back to the run timing, uh, if the species are shifting and they're coming back in 
uh, timing that's a little bit different, then that does complicate management because, of course, we rely on past uh, run timing and averages. And that. so it introduces more uncertainty and that basically would probably default to a lower fishing rate. Uh, and then you would pick up as you increased your confidence. But I don't think the overlap really is the issue at the time. No, and they're, they're going to overlap in the nearshore reaches as they're returning. Um, oh, yeah. if there's an overlap yeah. in, in, right, in return timings. Okay, thank you, Chris. Okay. Mark, we're right on 750, mm -hmm. so uh, we into a 10 minute break again. We seem to be very generous with breaks today for some reason. And that, so we will come back at eight o'clock exactly for another hour. Thank you. Great, thanks. Night, night.
And we're back. I believe that the next presentation by Angelica Pena and Tatiana Ross is by video, if I'm correct. So I think we can just proceed. Well, thanks for inviting us to talk, even though we don't have much to say about salmon. Um, I think that it's uh, important that, that the Lime P program be considered as uh, offering some great data to put the cruises into perspective. So we're going to be talking about trends and observations at Ocean Station Papa and along the whole of Lime P and the relevance to the two texts. And so here I'm showing um, line P in red on the map with the cruise stations from the two cruises. And you can see that the line P stations from, from P20 to P26 overlap with uh, the sampling that was done in both years. So just a little history for those who don't know, line P extends from the coast, which you can see there, out to Ocean Station Papa, and we, we call it OSP for Ocean Station Papa, sometimes Station Papa, and sometimes P26. It all means the same thing, and you'll probably see different versions of that throughout this talk. And uh, so sampling started in 1956 um, at um, Ocean Station Papa, and then um, along the line, it was introduced uh, in 1959. So there's 60 years of data or, or more at most places. And um, it was started with the Weathership program. So during the Weathership era, there were few stations sampled, but with high temporal resolution because the ship would go out there. And particularly at Ocean Station Papa, it would stay out for six weeks and sample daily out there. Um, and now with the Weathership program ending in the early 80s, um, DFO has been running the cruises three times a year, well, four times a year in the early years, but now it's three times a year at all of those 27 stations shown, and also collecting more variables since 1981. And so we'll be talking about stuff that we think is relevant to this program. And the slide is not advancing. Ah, there we go. So first, I'm actually not going to talk about line P data so much as just some of the larger context. So this is uh, satellite sea surface temperature anomalies. And we can see here um, 2019, and, and this is averaged over the whole year. So you can see that 2019 and 2020 had marine heat wave conditions. It's very red, um, not quite as strong as during what we call the blob, the blob years shown there. Um, and uh, but still, basically, the message is there was a marine heat wave on during both of those cruises. And so that's something that should be taken into consideration. And here I'm going to show, I shown the red line, line P on there again, Ocean Station Papa, and I'm going to switch to showing some data just from Ocean Station Papa in the next slide. So this is just the evolution of ocean temperature. So it's Argo data, which is what's giving really high resolution data. Um, and there's an Argo float shown on the side there, just to highlight that. But also the the climatology that it's, that it's calculated relative to comes from um, the long time series of uh, line P because the um, <clears throat> the Argo data, while it has really great temporal resolution, doesn't go as far back. Um, and you can see the marine heat wave in the subsurface waters because here we're seeing the temperature anomaly as a function of depth over the years. And you can see um, that there was marine heat wave conditions in 2019 and also in 2020, and it was subsurface. In fact, the highest anomalies were around 50 meters beneath the surface. Um, yeah, that's what I just said. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted also to highlight that it was a bit different, um, that these this marine heat wave during the 2019-2020 period is a bit different from the earlier blob. And then this is just the... Uh, figure to illustrate the impact on stratification. So what's highlighted here, what the lines are, are lines of constant density. So when when uh, lower density water makes, or sort of higher density water, the stuff that sits lower in the water column during most of the year gets to the surface in the winter, that brings up nutrients. And so strong mixing is good for productivity. And the uh, during the blob, there was really low mixing. You can see that, that highlighted 
isopycnol didn't make it. And then it kind of went back to normal mixing for a little while. And then now it's also reduced mixing in 2019 and 2020. And that's what I just said. <laughs> and I think the next slide is Angelica. Uh, thanks, Tatiana. Thanks, Tatiana. So this increase in, in, in stratification in recent years have reduced the nutrient concentration in the upper layer at uh, along line P. And here I'm showing uh, the upper layer mix layer the mixed layer nutrient concentration and online P, and in the left is nitrate and the right is silicate concentration for the winter, spring, and summer. Um, in winter, the black line shows the mean average for 2000 to 2018, and the shaded region is a region is a standard deviation. And we see that in winter of 2015, which is showing in the yellow line, uh, nutrients were quite low compared with the average. And uh, nutrients were also low in winter in 2019 and the winter of 2020. So these um, winter values, you know, um, produce changes further along the year and phytoplankton is consuming the nutrients in the spring and summer and uh, you see that in the summer nutrients are not completely depleted in the offshore portion of line p and that is because nitrate is not the main uh, nutrient limiting phytoplankton in this region but is iron so in normal years nitrate at Ocean Station Papa, and it's really between P20 and Ocean Station Papa, in most year nutrients are high during the whole year, from the winter to the summer, because nutrient is not being completely consumed because of iron limitation. Uh, as you can see in this figure, in 2019, nutrient was depleted all along the transect, and this was a very unusual event and it's the first time we see this depletion of nutrient at Ocean Station Papa in the, sec in the 60 years of observations. Um, you can see that silicate is also reduced, but it's not always um, the same uh, rate of reduction than the nutrient. Um, another thing to notice is that in winter 2020, surface nutrients were lower than during the blob years. And this is due to the presence of the eddy that we are going to discuss later. Um, and as I mentioned, in this summer of, 20, of 2019, winter were really, uh, nutrients were really depleted along line P. Uh, if we look at the vertical profile at Ocean Station Papa now, we see that in the winter of 2015, 19 and 20 that are shown in uh, magenta, red and black, the density of the upper layer was quite low. It was similar in, the, in those three years and nutrient concentration were in general lower than were observed in the other 20 years. Um, but in addition to this um, density that were not so dense like in other years, we see that the depth of the winter mix layer was shallower in 2015 and sorry in 2019 and 2020 and, and in 2020 it was quite deeper so there are two different um, things in here one is that the density are the same in this in these three years but the mix layer is not. So that could be probably producing some of the changes in the summer nutrient concentration that we see. Um, and in addition, of course, there are changes in the phytoplankton consuming those nutrients. So here what I'm showing is now the region of summer nutrient depleted along line P. And you can see that the nitrate that is shown in the left panel uh, show 2019 with uh, nitrate being depleted at all the station along line P and you don't see any other time that this happened. In comparison, silicate became depleted some other years along line P. So night silicate depletion is less unusual along line P. 
Um, if we now look at the long, at the uh, entire time series of line P nutrient concentration from P6 to OSP, we see that there are uh, periods where nutrients anomalies that are showing here are negative and other that are positive. In the 1990s and in the most recent years, so in the last six years, we see that nitrate had been in general negative anomalies, which means that nitrate has been lower than the average for 1970 to 1982. Uh, now, if I look at the average of the line P anomalies that is plot in the lower plot, in the red line, you see that there are decadal changes in this nitrogen anomaly, which is seem to be linked to the North Pacific gyro oscillation that is shown here in the black line. Black lane. So these uh, changes in the decadal um, variation seem to be um, consistent all along line P, and they are related to this climate index. Uh, in terms of the phytoplankton, we see in general low phytoplankton concentration along line P, except for, uh, except for sporadic bloom, usually of diatoms that are shown in blue. The, the phytoplankton that is most abundant during the, in the line P at all time is haptophytes. But um, in 2016, in 15, in the summer during the blob, we saw an unusual increase in sign of bacteria in the transition region of line P. So in, during 2015, the biomass was low and the phytoplankton was mostly a sign of bacteria rather than aptophytes. Back to you, Tatiana. Okay, so now I wanted to talk a little bit more uh, about some big picture things, mostly to do with uh, currents and, and eddies. So first I wanted to bring up this picture of the main currents in the Northeast Pacific and talk about this North Pacific current that tends to go right across the, um, from, from west to east across the um, Pacific and, um, and talk about sort of the location of that. It's something that uh, the zooplankton people are often quite um, interested in, which is, you know, where that bifurcation is, where, the, where it splits and the part that goes north into the Alaska current and south into the California current because it has been shown to be relevant to zooplankton populations. Now I think I probably have to wake this up so I can go to the next slide. Yes, and so I did a bit of an analysis based on Argo data again. Um, this is similar to what um, how Freeland had done in the past um, and just sort of using the floats and, and the um, dynamic height uh, and the streamlines from that to calculate where that bifurcation is. And you can see one example from one month on the bottom uh, right hand there. And that dot, that dashed line is sort of that bifurcation latitude as a, as a function of longitude. And then on uh, the next panel across with so the bottom left, you can see where that bifurcation latitude is on the fi uh, 150 um, longitude and then an average over 130 to 180. Um, and you can see uh, there's variation in that. And there's also variation in how much goes north, what is the fraction, and that's what's shown above there. So there's the total dynamic, um, dynamic height drop across in the black line and then the pink line shows the fraction that's going into the Alaskan gyre. And you can see that 2020 is, is a bit um, low, so lowering up there. And um, so there's not a big change in the bifurcation latitude, um, although it's different than during the blob years, um, because it was different during the blob years, um, but the fraction going north is less. And, and then um, eddies. I think eddies are probably important to the interpretation of the at least the 2020 data. So here I'm showing two um, sea level anomaly maps from satellite data, just from the a midday, like a one day during the middle of each of the two cruises. And you can see those yellow parts are where there's a sea level anomaly and those are generally eddies and um, they typically form in the formation regions indicated on the left-hand panel. Um, 
in coastal regions and they're oops this thing's always going to sleep sorry <laughs> to wake it up every time and they and they transport warm water um basically coastal shelf water and associated nutrients and and the communities of, of plankton um and offshore um, so both zooplankton and phytoplankton offshore into the high nutrient low chlorophyll regions and that's illustrated in that figure and there was one that was right on line p um, in 2020 and we fortunately had a glider pass through it and map it out and you can see the temperature anomaly there um, there was also an oxygen anomaly associated with it um, and it impacted the data that were collected on the line p cruises as well um, and then you can also track these eddies by taking these daily images and just looking at the center of them and tracking them along. And I'm showing the lines of these eddies. So you can see that they originated in coastal water and moved offshore. Um, and then this shows on the left, all the eddies from 2019 and 2020 and where they intersect the, um, the cruise stations. And then on the right, I'm showing uh, basically all of them, all the tracks from since 2015, just to illustrate that that northern portion does tend to get more eddies. But it looks like in for these particular years, it's really the 2020 having two Haida eddies intersecting it that's probably more relevant to the interpretation of the data. Now pass that back to Angelica. So, uh, we can see the effect of the Haida eddy in 2020 in the nutrient profiles of um, nitrate and silicate at Ocean Station Papa. Um, one of the things that is, um, it was obvious, uh, was that uh, the nutrient concentration in winter, or that was unusual, was the nutrient concentration in winter, especially silicate, were higher in, were lower in winter than in summer. So this increase in summer nutrient was due to the to the uh, to the transport of nutrient by the eddy, which increased the amount of nutrient in the upper layer. So during this year, we cannot really compare the winter and nitrate values and say and estimate how much was the consumption by phytoplankton because it was not the same water mass that was sampled in winter and in summer. Um, in addition, we can see here the dissolved oxygen, and here are the uh, oxygen anomalies in winter. And um, you can see that in 2020, uh, the anomalies are a bit stronger than in other years, and that this is most likely due to the to the eddy near Ocean Station Papa. Um, and what I wanted to show here is mostly that. Um, oxygen below the pycnocline has been uh, lower than during the average of 2001 and 2010, the winter values, and uh, this is um, most likely due to the to changes in the ventilation of the of this layer. So um, I'm pointing here the 100 uh, micromole per kilogram, that is about 2.3 ml per liter and i think the one that most people will be interested in is the one at around 60 2.5 ml per liter and you can see that at that depth that is about 300 to 400 meters uh, oxygen have declined and online p have declined a bit but it's not the region that shows the strongest anomalies um, but this decline in oxygen is consistent with the trend with the long-term trend of oxygen at uh, Ocean Station Papa and uh, that show a linear decline from the 1950s to 2020. And this decline is observing all the isopignals. And, um, and you can see that um, the decline in, in the, at, uh, from the 1950s is quite, quite clear and is significant. In contrast, that before the most um, one of the station near the shell break, the decline is not there is not a linear decline, but it's more um, there was more an increase in oxygen up to the mid 1980s, and then a decline 
to the 2010 and oxygen has been increasing at this isopignal in recent years. So it's two different signals there because condition at OSP are not the same condition that happen near shore. And now back to you, Tatiana. Okay, so just one more little uh, tidbit from sort of long-term trends things uh, from Ocean Station Papa again is just we see the ocean is warming, so the ocean heat content averaged over depth is increasing. Um, you can see though on that plot there's a lot of variability, so it kind of um, it's partially, I put that there just to remind people that you can't really just look at a few years and see, see trends very well. So um, these marine heat waves might be indicating some kind of new normal, they might not, um, because it could persist as long as it has without um, it being really a trend. Um, and then uh, just related to stratification, so to nutrients and mixing, uh, there is actually no trend. Although the ocean is warming, there is no significant trend um, in stratification where it counts. So there, the seasonal stratification, which is shown in panel, uh, well, the first panel, um, panel A, which is showing um, basically um, stratification as a function of depth, you can see that seasonal stratification is very sharp, and it's actually been increasing. Um, getting stronger with each decade, but the permanent picnocline, which is really the barrier to bringing nutrients up from underneath, hasn't shown any trends. Um, and then just to summarize, um, just want to highlight that the six decades of observations from Ocean Station Papa and along Line P allow us to put the 2019 and 2020 um, cruises into context. Um, just some highlights, the eddies strongly influence the variability um, and really should probably be interpreted when um, thinking about spatial variability in the da data from the cruises, particularly 2020, but also 2019. Um, the recent years are unusual. There's marine heat waves and it's been having um, effects across the oceanography. Um, along line P, there was a si significant decrease in nutrients and subsurface oxygen during the marine heat waves. There were significant changes in phytoplankton, biomass and community composition that resulted. Um, so it looks like there's changes at the base of the food web during and after the blow that could have ecosystem-wide implications. So something that should be taken into consideration. And that the observations show a long-term increase in ocean heat content and decrease in subsurface oxygen, but no change in the stratification barrier to nutrient delivery. And that's it, thanks. Well, thank you, ladies. That was great review. It is such a rich data system, and biologically, we don't really use it much when it comes to fish. So I think you're going to hear from us on that. Uh, Mark, we only have a short period, uh, a couple of minutes for questions, and I'm sure there will be some. So let's see what's there. Okay, we've got two minutes and 30 seconds for questions, so go ahead. <laughs> I cannot hear you, Mark. No. Um, in the meantime, I would like okay. to say that. Um, oh, do you have a? Ah, that's a good one. Okay, so here's a question okay. I could read for you. <laughs> Angelica, do you see the question on your screen? Yep. Yeah, I see, the I, I see okay, it. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one of you just uh, want to move. take that? Um, so they, they move at different, different speeds. They They're kind of slow. random. Yeah. But, um, but they the height of eddies. Time. Sorry. The height of eddies in particular, they move, they take, um, so the one that we observed on, in uh, 2020, so the winter of 2020, um, at or near Ocean Station Papa was created two years earlier, um, just yeah. off Haida Gwaii. Wow, it is a long time. Yeah, I would like to. Yeah, I would like to mention that usually the eddy, um, the reason you don't see the effect of the eddy on phytoplankton, you see it more in the nutrient and zooplankton, is because it takes that long to get 
to the offshore, it moves slowly. So by then the phytoplankton has had many communities exchange, so you don't really see the effect of the eddy itself, but it does affect the, the zooplankton because there is a longer generation time. So it will be interesting to see in the zooplankton data if the eddies are evident. Okay. So there um, is interannual variability in the timing and size of eddies, and I don't really know how, it's a chaotic system. It's hard to predict, like yeah. it seems, uh, it, there is variability, yes, but uh, I don't know what is causing it. And the marine heat waves, I don't know that they're that important because it would have to be changing the sort of circulation patterns. And so it may change the nature of the eddies, but I don't know how much impact it's going to have on the generation and timing. Yeah. Well, I think it's an interesting question because your comment about the heat content increasing over the long period. You, one would think that increased heat content would change the physics of the currents as well. So I'm not sure but how the sensitive they'd be. Yeah, but the generation is of the it is in near the shore. And, and you know, at mm. iOS, we did quite a bit of a study a few years ago to study these cities, and they really are forming the Queen Charlotte, of the Queen Charlotte. And the generation and the transport, they are not necessarily you know, one to one, they are not completely connected. So, you know, maybe the, the way they get and how long they take is different, but it's not really related to the generation itself. Anyway, I think okay, anyway, well, thank they're you great very much. questions. I'm going to have to move on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, so thanks again, folks. Okay, the last talk for today uh, is going to be given by Eugeni Paganoff again, and he's going to be filling in for Natalie. Um, and I've been waiting to hear the answer to this for a couple of years. So, Yogeni, thank you for filling in. Let's get you going. Thank you very much. And um, okay, uh, seem to be working. Um, so um, I will be talking today um, about how do we compare zooplankton samples collected by Bongo and Jude nets and. Uh, um, this is going to be um, uh, based on the data collected in 2019. So from the moment we started really creating uh, uh, new nets, and let's say uh, uh, this process uh, of designing new nets, this process exploded in about 60s and 70s, 1960s and 70s of the last century. Um, we started having problems because every new net, while it was really sophisticated and better catching stuff, there was always a question, a lingering question, but how does this compare to the previous ones and whether or not um, uh, they are in any way comparable. Uh, there is a huge literature about this and I'll not go, but I'll just show you a few s s s snapshots of this. However, there, it was a big question and it, it, it was uh, really addressed uh, for about, uh, let's say past 20 years. I would not say that they entirely addressed. And the ideal, uh, probably the closest, uh, um, closest uh, comparison, which is on on the right side, so in the Jude and W nets, uh, which are compared in the Norwegian Russian monitoring in the Barents Sea, um, and this is the perfect comparison when you actually put nets in one um, in one setting, and you can actually tow them right next to each other. Uh, we didn't have this opportunity, um, and. Uh, uh, but we did have opportunity during 2019 expedition to collect using both nets, using both designs, and in fact, both designs which are used by Russians already for several decades, and by Canadians also for several decades. Um, uh, Jude Bongo comparison was uh, done in terms of uh, taxonomic composition, and it's, uh, this is unpublished uh, report by Dave Kimmel and uh, Ed Farley when they've done during the basis expedition in the Bering Sea. And uh, what they done, they compared the Jude net and a bonga, small bonga net with the same mesh size, but one of them was towed vertically and another one uh, using oblique toes. And uh, surprisingly, um, as Dave mentioned, that overall the agreement between the gears was fairly consistent, which is very good news. Um, uh, but uh, some notable exceptions, of course, were um, available, but he would say that two gears are broadly comparable. And he brings here already that uh, 
um, that maybe the concentrations of, of, of zooplankton might actually be affecting how this, uh, uh, whether or not these gears are comparable. So what we had in 2019, we had a, a very rare opportunity when we, we, had the, we um, consequently sampled first using JudaNet, and this was a, a, a Russian design, single net, uh, 0.01 meter squared mesh, uh, mass area, 160 micron mesh, zero uh, from 200 to zero vertical net and bonga net, which had two uh, two nets, and this is photograph uh, below showing the, and the uh, mass area was bigger, about uh, two and a half times bigger, and the mesh size was 235. There we also sampled vertically from about 250 meters to zero. But we did have opportunity during this survey to have a 33, 34 stations where we sampled uh, them together and uh, this constituted 11 daytime and 23 nighttime samples. However, um, we were following the uh, zooplankton processing protocol uh, kind of established long time ago and uh, the net, uh, if you look on the left side, uh, the net uh, sample was actually used uh, here, it's like a split zooplankton splitter, uh, but we had two nets in the bonga. One net was preserved in the formaldehyde and another net was, was pulled through the series of sieves and then oven dried and weighed. Um, the interesting point to consider here is not just the different design, but also different mesh. And uh, on the right side, you can see the um, classical uh, representations by Galliene and Robbins when they compared uh, the same net with a different mesh sizes. You can see that uh, uh, two red lines representing of, let's say, uh, Jude net mesh size and uh, Bongo net on the left and Bongo net uh, mesh size on the right, uh, indicating that uh, both abundance and biomass could be drastically different in those two nets. We had to really overcome this. How we've done this? We, uh, when we were processing samples, we were uh, size fractionating them into uh, uh, five uh, size classes. And this is a stack on top of each other um, mesh sizes from about 0.25 millimeters to about four millimeters. And this is kind of how the sample look like when you, when you uh, sieve them through. However, uh, the differences were that there was a fresh material for the bonga net and a formalin preserved material for Jude net. Um, I will kind of uh, come back to this right in the end. Samples were oven dried uh, for um, to, to the constant state, uh, weight and the dry weight. So we limited in this presentation comparison to up to about uh, eight, eight, eight millimeters mesh size. So the limited comparison up to about four millimeter mesh um, uh, sieve. Um, usually the sieve is uh, uh, split into the different size classes, but uh, whatever I will be presenting here is from about 0.25 millimeters up to about eight millimeters. Okay, um, now, uh, just before we started, we just, okay, we, we have to make some kind of predictions. From what our knowledge tells us and our exp experience, that JudaNet would catch a lower biomass than BongoNet. Okay, we will see how, how it works. Then the second prediction was uh, there would be no differences between day and night bongo and Jude ratios. The, the third prediction would be there would be no differences between bongo and Jude ratios in different size fractions of zooplankton. And uh, finally, bongo and Jude ratios uh, would be stable in relation to, to the biomass code. Um, I deliberately said that we started from 0.25, so we excluded the smallest size fraction from the Jude net, so the nets would be comparable uh, from that point of view. So, in the next several uh, slides, there will be um, uh, the same order of uh, the same sequence. This is a size fraction of 0.25 or 0.5 millimeters, meaning that this uh, zooplankton passed through the 0.5 millimeter mesh but was retained by the 0.25 millimeter. And the top uh, upper uh, lever, uh, left panel is the bonga biomass. A uh, 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 bottom uh, uh, left panel is Jude biomass on the same stations. And uh, on the right upper panel is a ratio between bonga uh, to, uh, to Jude. 
As you can see, there is no surprise, both of the Bong and JudaNet actually showed a pretty similar distribution in a smaller size fraction. And the ratios were, uh, except a couple of exceptions, were, uh, were pretty comparable uh, in majority of the stations. However, the mean uh, during the daytime and nighttime were about, uh, uh, were about two, between 1.9 and 2.2 uh, um, fold. So Bonga was catching uh, slightly more than than uh, than uh, than JudaNet. In the next uh, size fraction, 0.5 to 1 millimeters, the same pattern. But when you look into the ratio, ratio was again a little bit higher. First of all, and it's uh, on on the mean, ex and it was one uh, obvious ex exception when uh, a large stuff was apparently caught by Bonga. But the mean ratio during the day and during the night were a little bit higher than the previous one. So it was a three during the day and 2.2 uh, during the night time. And um, just going through this quickly, uh, the next size fraction would be one to two millimeters. Again, um, it's a little bit more patchy in terms of distribution. And again, uh, pretty high daytime ratio between Bongo and, 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 and Juvenet. Uh, while my time was hovering about uh, uh, two ratio. Um, I think finally there is a, uh, there is a, a size fraction which is uh, the largest size fraction. Okay, largest size fraction, which is four to eight millimeters. And again, uh, you can see now m m uh, uh, more difference in the distribution. So Bongo is much more efficient in catching the larger size fractions. And the, uh, however, the catch, um, the, uh, um, the ratio is actually uh, went down a little bit. And again, stabilized at about two. So this is the total biomass. So entire sample, which was point, uh, from 0 .0, uh, 0.25 millimeters to eight millimeters. And again, the distribution was similar in a way, although uh, uh, Bonganet was actually catching a little bit more zooplankton and, uh, uh, and higher concentration. So if you look into the distribution and ratios, the ratios were high and slightly higher in the Northern part and lower in the southern part. And if you combine both day and night, that would be a ratio on, on in the box on, on the left, uh, on the right bottom side, 1.96. So if we combine all of this, just to, uh, to see this visually, this is all the bonded to Judy biomass ratios. Uh, uh, open, open bars are daytime, uh, field bars, dark, dark uh, black bars are night times and uh, day plus night, uh, it's in the end. And what you can see that there is a consistently higher, um, although maybe not, it's not significantly different, but there are consistently higher ratios um, uh, during the daytime between those two nets. And the ratios are showing increase in the middle sized uh, uh, size groups and they kind of show very similar in the higher and the larger and the smaller size groups. That's, a, that's an interesting finding. And uh, I think, um, uh, but they're still not, not that different. Um, and it's pretty consistent, which was, uh, which was quite important. There, was a, there were also some very big, uh, because of the exceptional samples, there were some very big standard deviations. So the, bar, uh, the arrow bars are standard deviations in this, in this graph. This is a very big, uh, a very complicated picture. However, what, what it does shows is it shows the biomass uh, Bonga versus Jude. And uh, um, what is that? Is there's six sets of two, two, uh, two, uh, two panels, and it's for each uh, size class. What I can say that almost uh, that uh, uh, there's almost no exceptions. Uh, what we see here is the at low zooplankton concentrations. Differences between biomass caught by both nets were the highest, meaning that bonga nets were much more efficient in catching uh, zooplankton. Um, so um, it was observed both in the left and in, in right panels throughout all the size classes. 
and uh, you can see the the relationship it was visually more bonga uh, samples in the low catches in in the low concentrations and there was a much higher ratios at the low concentrations of zooplankton. Um, however, what we also observed that with the increase in biomass, the differences decreased. Um, and uh, this also, again, uh, you can see in both, uh, in, in both panels. And uh, <clears throat> because, the, uh, especially in the right panel, that uh, the uh, ratios between Bonga and Jube at the high biomass are uh, approaching one, which means they are almost uh, one to one comparable. <clears throat> what what what, it, what does it mean? Uh, this is most likely related to more patchy zooplankton distribution during the daytime, and uh, it's more patchy. Uh, zooplankton is more patchy distributed when uh, there are low concentrations. There is also a, a component here which I should not uh, um, kind of avoid that uh, net avoidance could be, uh, could be the factor here because if uh, JudaNet had a 2.5 times uh, um, uh, smaller uh, mouth area and uh, during the daytime and during the low concentration, smaller mouth area would unavoidably underestimate zooplankton concentrations, especially during the vertical curves. So let's now go back to our predictions and uh, let's say just go one by one. So what we found during this intercomparison, that Judean nets would catch less biomass than Bonga. That's true. Um, there would be no differences between day and night Bonga uh, to Jude ratios. It's false. We, we consistently observe that during the day, uh, the ratios were higher, uh, although maybe not significantly, but they were higher. Um, quite dramatic, 30 to 40 percent higher than uh, during the night. Uh, there would be no differences between bonga jube net ratios and different size fractions of zooplankton. It's also happened to be false because um, they are different uh, in, in size, in some of the size fractions, and it's like uh, lower uh, ratios in the smaller size fractions and the higher, larger size fractions, and increase in the size fractions in the middle middle size classes. And bonga Jude ratios would be stable in relation to the biomass code. Also happened to be false because the higher the biomass, the more comparable those two nets become. become. So take home message is that the bonga to Jude ratio, and that's a good news, is about two. And uh, with the standard deviation of about 0.8. This is for the total biomass. And I would say that this number can actually go a little bit down because we used uh, a fresh biomass in the bunga nets and a, a, a formaldehyde a fixed biomass in Jude nets. That's the way it actually worked out. But I would say that uh, when you fixed it in formaldehyde, you may lose up to about 20 to 25 percent of the uh, of the dry weight or, or, or of the sample. So this ratio pro could probably go a little bit down to uh, maybe, let's say, between 1.5 to about two times uh, higher, this ratio between the Bonga and Judena. And lastly, uh, there is a little issue of uh, different depths sampled. You, you noticed in the beginning that the Judena sampled 200 meters water column, while Bonga net sampled 250 meters of the... Uh, I wouldn't say that it might actually make a big dent, but it may be affected. What it, what's important here, and pr probably we, we can discuss it a little bit later in, uh, in the discussions for the 2022 expedition, is that this actually creates a, a hope that we can compare those two, uh, two nets. And uh, uh, although we agreed already what the sampling protocol of Zooplankton will be uh, during the 2022, uh, uh, this uh, gives us opportunity and would aid the better uh, zooplankton compilation into a single database across the North Pacific. And that's all from me. Thank you very much. I cannot hear you. Thank you. Yeah. OK, obviously, I just said thank you for standing in. That was nice and clear. Thank you. Showing any obvious questions there, Mark? Uh, yes, we've got one from Tatiana. 
Fascinating. Do you have an idea why the highest ratio is highest for the two millimeter size class? Naively, I'd have imagined it would continue to increase with size. Um, it's, it's an interesting question. I actually uh, thought this as well. I do not have any explanation unless there was a something uh, related to the uh, 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 formaldehyde fixation. When you actually fix the zooplankton with formaldehyde, it's up to about the 20 to 25 percent of the biomass may be lost. But we also do know that zooplankton also shrink. And maybe this kind of maybe changed uh, changed uh, what portions are going into let's say previous uh, size fraction and, uh, and staying in a, in a, on one size fraction. So there is a, a I mean ideally we would we would like to have this bongo and uh, Judy nets both used like for example we fix the sample with formaldehyde keep them at the same time and then we analyze them in the same way. We just had a very good opportunity because uh, during 2019 uh, uh, and the Russian uh, methodology is to process the samples and, and throw them overboard uh, at sea. Um, I just managed to preserve this, uh, this, these samples and uh, we, we size fractionated them already here in my lab in Canada to make sure that we actually have some comparable uh, information. But it's still, it still ranges between two and three. And uh, some of this, uh, you can see that where the highest count, the highest ratios were observed in the middle size, there was a, also the highest uh, standard deviations observed. That means there was a huge variability. And it was, in fact, only one or two places which might have been driving this. So I would say about two, uh, um, uh, twofold uh, is uh, probably a golden, uh, golden uh, number. Okay. Uh, nothing more coming coming forward, Brian. Okay. Well, if there's nothing more, I think that probably draws us to an end for this evening. And that so mm -hmm. excellent talks all the way around. Thank you very much to all the speakers. And uh, tomorrow. Hard to believe, but we're coming to the end. We'll have another session and uh, with a discussion panel at the end. Actually, we have a speaker to end as well and then the panel. So I expect tomorrow we'll go full term. All right. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night.